2015. In um, roughly October of 2015, the monitor was brought in. We are now in our fourth year of, of uh, being under a monitor. And in the three years since um, the monitor came on and we started the implementation of the consent decree, we have tackled some very major things. As, as you might remember, the consent decree addresses use of force and um, it had some requirements in there for us to revise policies, to revise um, our training curriculum, and to train folks on certain things. Within use of force, there's a lot of things bundled about how use of force is accomplished. In addition to that, we had obligations concerning crisis intervention when our officers respond to folks who are in crisis. And, and generally, um, folks who are in crisis are deemed to be people who are having some mental health issues when we respond. Um, in addition to that, we, we have search and seizure um, policies that we are going to be re redoing um, along with some new data collection in the area of search and seizure that we had not done before. Um, the other large part of the consent decree addresses just that, data collection and our use of data in um, having the police be more effective and in terms of accountability. Um, and you mentioned the police commission. That was another portion of the consent decree because um, a focus of the consent decree is repairing and developing the relationship between the citizens and the police division. And the community police commission was appointed as, as a uh, community representative organization to help um, rep um, with the relationship between the police and the community. So the big things that we have tackled so far, and the implementation coordinator, Greg White, will go into more detail, have addressed our um, use of force, and we've revis revised policies. We have done extensive retraining on, on um, both use of force and the new policies. Um, and that has been the, one of the largest chunks. In addition to that, the other thing that we've spent a lot of time on are the crisis intervention points. And so we've made significant progress so far in the implementation of the consent decree, and I'll leave it to Greg to describe the details. Sure, and um, I um, just for those watching or wondering, why does he always refer to this guy as Judge White? Um, you know, uh, he was a magistrate in, uh, in federal court, and. Uh, and um, so it's a, an important title and, and an honor that uh, I will always uh, refer to him as, as, as Judge White. Um, to my colleagues, uh, Director Lang Henry needs to step out in a little bit for about 15, 20 minutes, but Mr. Singleton from the, the law department will be here and then she'll join us back in a little bit. I just didn't want it to be awkward for her um, because she has an, a, a, an important engagement she can't miss, but we'll be back with us shortly. Uh, good morning, Judge White. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Never better, thank you. Good. So um, we heard Director Langhenry outline, you know, kind of the three main essential elements uh, around policy, training, and equipment. We're here to kind of uh, get a perspective from you on the type of progress that we're making and, uh, and then to get perspectives from others who are here at the table as well. So please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of council. Uh, I really uh, have pretty good news, I think, to, uh, to report to you this morning about the progress under the consent decree, and I want to concentrate somewhat on the uh, monitor's uh, sixth semi-annual report, which uh, I don't know if everybody has had an opportunity to look at, but I know we forwarded that uh, to you, I think, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and and, and I, I believe, uh, through the hard work of the folks sitting at this table and many that aren't here, uh, we, we have gotten to the point where we have turned uh, this process from one of writing policies and plans uh, and having those plans and policies approved mm -hmm. to actually implementation. That is that, that we need to establish that we are in uh, substantial and effective compliance with the consent decree and we have to stay there for a period of two years in most instances but at least one year in the area of search and seizure. So without quibbling about what really is uh, substantial and effective compliance, you know, we, we are moving into implementation and our obligation here as, uh, as the city and the PD is to show progress, to show that we are, are governing the, the department, the department is operating according to those plans and policies over time. Uh, and uh, that time, as I described, is uh, up to two years. So we, have not, we are not in substantial compliance as we speak. 
uh, w whether we will be by the end of this year is uh, is questionable in my mind. I would say we would not be in total and uh, effective and substantial in compliance by the end of this year in all categories, but we're going to be close. Uh, and so I think that's that's good news for the city uh, in terms of, of moving forward with the consent decree. Um, we have come a long way under very difficult circumstances, and I think we could summarize all the plans and policies that we've made, which I think are important. The use of force uh, obviously was, a, was something that was done uh, early on through a long process of, of give and take with the Department of Justice and the monitor, but it was uh, heralded as uh, uh, real progress in terms of rewriting the policies and, and the, the quality of training that was done. Uh, under those policies. What does that really mean in the real world? So we have new use of force policies. What does that mean? Well, in the monitor six-month report, they, they reported that uh, the, the uh, use of force by the department uh, in 2018 was down 29 percent from the previous year. Uh, that, that, at the same time, they reported that part one crimes were down in the city except for rape uh, in that same time period. But, uh, but even more importantly, perhaps, well, is, is, a, is a resulting officer injuries. Uh, the officer injuries in force incidents were down 22 percent, mm. and the injuries to subjects who were being, uh, that, that force was being exercised against, and the mm -hmm. department has to exercise force in, in the course of its activities, mm -hmm. the injuries to subjects that, result, that w were involved in those use of force was down 17 percent from the previous year. So I think that's uh, significant progress. Mm -hmm. Also, from the statistical standpoint, our own use of force report, our annual use of force report, which is uh, posted on the city website at this point in time, uh, indicated that the department had 303,930,000 uh, calls for service uh, in 2018. The department made 15,615 arrests uh, in that year, and yet, they, they, the reportable use of force had only 338 incidents out of 15,000 some arrests. Oh. That's pretty uh, significantly uh, uh, important, I think, for uh, the kind of progress that has been made here. And even more, uh, I guess, to the point is 229 of the 338 force report, reported force incidents were level one, the very lowest level of force that the department exercises that, that doesn't result in, in uh, any kind of real injury to folks. It's a, it may be a complaint of injury. It may be uh, unholstering and pointing a firearm, which was a significant number of, of those level one incidents of force. But I think that, that, that the statistics kind of give you a feel for what, really, what the force policies really mean uh, in terms of the real world. Uh, clearly, the uh, crisis intervention uh, policies and training that this department has put on uh, received uh, probably the most glowing comments from the monitor during the course of, of this last six months uh, and year, really, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, being uh, a national model on how departments uh, should write policies and do training uh, on dealing with folks in crisis that, uh, that they, they encounter on the street. So that has been, been a very successful operation. We have approved our search and seizure policies uh, in terms of how the, the uh, department interacts with folks on the street, who gets stopped, under what circumstances, who, who gets arrested, under what circumstances. Uh, and the bias-free policies uh, have uh, also uh, been approved. So I want to commend you know, Captain Simon and his crew, D.C. O'Neill, the chief, and everyone for all the efforts that they've made in, in uh, the very challenging uh, prospect of writing all of these policies. The, uh, the search and seizure uh, policies will have training later this year along with final training on bias free uh, and those policies should be implemented uh, before the end of the year is, is uh, in, in, and in effect on the streets uh, for the department. So what, what we turn to now is really the, the new frontier is data. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that, that uh, the only way we show compliance and the only way we show that we're actually operating uh, if, effectively under the policies is to uh, collect data on, on how we're policing uh, in the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still in the process, although IT department has done uh, a, a yeoman's work in terms of a, a getting an equipment and resource plan approved, we're still working on the details of how for instance, our community policing data and our CIT data will be collected. CIT data, for those listening, 
crisis intervention. Crisis intervention training. But go ahead. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's going to be the key. Uh, the, right now, we are doing the final training for the uh, community policing plan, mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing the annual uh, crisis intervention training. Uh, and the first uh, effort to collect data uh, is being conducted through the field, the, the uh, field-based reporting process, mm -hmm. and we're, we're writing the uh, cues, in essence, as to how the officers will enter that data. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be ready to go by the time the training is completed in July. Uh, we're going to have some field testing of, of uh, uh, the capability of collecting that data uh, early in, uh, in June, uh, and then uh, the, the community policing plan as well as the uh, data for CIT will be uh, actually collected real time uh, mm -hmm. on the street. The uh, search and seizure data and the uh, bias free data, we're still working on the, the uh, process of, of developing that uh, software in order to collect it, but that's going to be ready and up and running uh, prior to the time that uh, training is completed by the end of the year. So we should be in position mm -hmm. uh, to collect uh, the data we need to show that we're in compliance. Uh, obviously, uh, when we, we don't have a lot of good baseline information from years like 2016 uh, in terms of data, but uh, we have worked hard to get uh, in a position to collect all the data points that are required under the consent decree, and I believe there are 370 or so uh, of those data points. Um, the major plans have been completed. Uh, you know, I've mentioned the community policing plan, which uh, Commander Johnson is here and has worked very hard at, at uh, completing and uh, we are, are doing the training on that now. But that's kind of the keystone of uh, the, the plans as how we're going to interact with the community. But we've, we've had approved the equipment and resource plan as to how we're going to handle the, uh, the ability for the department to get data and use data in daily management. Um, we have completed the uh, recruitment plan. Uh, we've recruited a staffing plan. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the CPOP, and, all, and those plans, in essence, are supporting plans for the community policing. In other words, what kind of staffing do we need to do effective community policing in the city of Cleveland? And the goal is, uh, at least uh, for patrol officers at this point, to have 20 percent of their time devoted towards community engagement and problem solving. Uh, uh, within our various neighborhoods, uh, and that needs to be tracked as well. So, we, and we've done that without expending uh, money on outside consultants. I think the, the folks in the city have worked very hard uh, to uh, make those plans uh, uh, acceptable to the court, to the monitor team, to the Department of Justice, uh, and uh, we're I'm re really happy with uh, with how that has all progressed. The uh, manuals that we've worked on uh, have been also uh, quite extensive in terms of efforts. So the, the uh, Office of Professional Standards and the Police Review Board have manuals that they've been operating under, uh, I think, more efficiently f uh, over the course of the last year plus. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are on the cusp of approving the Internal Affairs Manual of how Internal Affairs is going to conduct investigations and what happens to those investigations, mm -hmm. as well as the Force Investigation Team Manual, which is that team that goes out investigating the most serious use of force uh, within the city. So we've been very successful, I think, at getting those plans written uh, uh, through some, again, very difficult circumstances. And just if I could pause you on that point, and to my colleagues, um, I think uh, three weeks from today or maybe four weeks from today, we're going to have um, uh, the Office of Professional Standards as well as the Civilian Police Review um, uh, members uh, come to the committee and just give us an update with what's going on with that as well. So we'll get that perspective result. I know they're Please working continue, on their Judge. annual report, which I think that you'll receive before uh, they come here exactly. for that. But, but OPS remains a, 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 a bit of a, of a problem, particularly in the backlog area. We've right. talked about that in previous visits I've made mm -hmm. here to this committee. Uh, but uh, the, well, the city has contracted with the, the Chicago-based investigative mm -hmm. firm Hillard Heinz mm -hmm. uh, to clean up those, those cases. I believe we sent 381 cases that were uh, dated prior to December 1 of 2017 to Hillard Heinz. Mm -hmm. uh, they are down to resolving the last 144 cases in phase three of this contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they are right now in the city. Uh, conducting interviews, I believe there were about 200 interviews of, of uh, uh, involved officers that uh, they were going to uh, complete uh, and uh, anticipate that within the next four months, those 144 cases will be 
completed from the investigative standpoint uh, and, be, and be prepared to be presented to the, to the police review board at some point in time. So that, I think that's real progress in the, in the, back, in the backlog. Uh, last time I was here, I think I reported on the number of cases that OPS is receiving, new cases, uh, and that it was significantly down to uh, from 664, a high in 2013, to 227 cases that they received in 2018. So, uh, you know, that in and of itself, I think. So 2014, 2013, 2064. 664, and in 2018? 227. 227, okay. So, you know, I, I think that uh, speaks well as to what is going on, not just at OPS, but within the department itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that, that, that they, remain, they remain current. OPS's responsibility for their current investigators is to not fall behind on cases that were filed after December 1st of 2017. Mm -hmm. And I think they've been able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, uh, you know, they'll speak for themselves when they get there in the report. So, um, I think that. Hey, Judge, can you get the microphone a little sure. closer? I'm sorry. His colleagues are having a hard time hearing. Right. Please continue. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I think that's that about sums up, uh, you know, where I think we're at with the consent decree, uh, and you know, we're anticipating over the course of the next six months that that uh, this progress is going to continue, uh -huh. uh, and that uh, we will. Uh, continue to have a good working relationship with the DOJ and the monitor team uh, and make progress towards substantial compliance. All right, Chief, um, we heard uh, uh, Chief Deputy Chief O'Neill and Captain Simon. We heard uh, uh, Judge White, uh, who is our implementation coordinator, talk a lot about search and seizure, data collection, use of force. Um, with that uh, comes a considerable amount of training. So. Give us a perspective um, about where we're at in terms of compliancy, and then talk a little bit, uh, you or your team, about what we're doing um, in terms of training in all of those elements. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, the committee. Um, before I answer your question, I want to start off by just um, a couple uh, points here. Sure. Uh, Judge White and Director Lang Henry uh, gave that broad overview of you know where we were when we started this process in 2015 where we're at now uh, and they um you know touched on all the things that we've really done uh, over the last uh, almost four years uh, i just want to reiterate a couple of points you know there are basically six major components of the consent decree itself uh, from use of force to accountability um, <clears throat> The most important piece uh, of those six, I, I think, are, are the what we refer to as CPOP or our community engagement, uh, because we talked about this early on in the um, negotiation process and, and starting the implementation uh, of at least my uh, concern that we didn't implement CPOP early on in the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, we started with use of force, which was one of the major components, which uh, was the concern of a lot of folks, uh, especially on the DOJ side and the monitoring team side. I understand that. Um, but regardless of what our use of forces are, and the judge talked about the stats, uh, you know, how they went down uh, a lot over the last couple of years, uh, we can have those policies in place. Our officers can do a great job, as they uh, often do. But if the community doesn't trust us, if we don't have those relationships and things in place, uh, we can have a, a use of force that complies with our policies, that's within the Constitution, within the laws of the state and this country and this city. And if the community doesn't trust us, we're still going to have issues. So although we're at the point now where uh, the CPOP plan uh, is close to being implemented, um, the people at this table and in this room can tell you that we haven't waited for the actual plan to be completed to actually implement uh, CPOP and community engagement within the city. And I think it shows by the, a lot of the numbers that the judge talked about with reduced complaints, reduced use of force, reduced injury to officers and suspects uh, in those uses of force. And, and I think uh, an increase in community engagement and how the community views the Cleveland Division of Police. So I just wanted to put that on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as our training, uh, we have uh, had some bumps in the road, so to speak, during this process over the last three and a half years uh, because it's a lot to do uh, in that time period. And you're talking about uh, policies and training 
of over 1,500 men and women of the Division of Police uh, that's going to be sustaining, that's going to be, as the judge spoke to, uh, things that are sustained uh, for the consent decree process over a two-year process, substantial and effective compliance. Uh, but, you know, as Mayor Jackson stated, when we started this process, you know, this is going to last long after we're not in a consent decree. Uh, this is going to become a part of the DNA of the Cleveland Division of Police. And I think we're on that track. Uh, I, I think that our officers out there get it. Um, you're always going to have bumps in the road. You're always going to have, uh, again, in an agency of 1,500, 1,600 officers and almost 300 civilians, you're always going to have things that happen uh, that shouldn't. And that's why the accountability measures that we have in place, that's why the training that we constantly stress, that's why the supervision that's out there that we always try to bolster and increase those ranks, uh, that's why all this, that stuff is in place to make sure that this holds long past the consent decree. And again, I think we're on the track to do that. Um, the training aspect, uh, Captain Simon, DC O'Neill, uh, the policy, the curriculum for the training, along with our training staff, and, and again, Commander Johnson is here on the CPOP side of this. Uh, they worked diligently over the last three and a half years to make sure, as the judge stated, that we have the best training for our officers, that it's realistic. Uh, most of our training is scenario-based, where the officers actually have to enact that training that they've learned. They have to act on it. They have to respond in a way that's compliant with the training, with our policies, and with the curriculum that they've learned to make sure that they get it. And that, I think, goes a long way in the way that the policy and the training is actually implemented on the streets. And again, it shows in the numbers that the judge talked about. And I think it shows that you know we haven't had an officer-involved shooting in almost two years here in the city. And I think it goes to not just the training and the consent decree process itself, but it goes to you know the men and women of this division and how they see our community and how they want to interact with our community and make sure that we're safe, uh, that we're safe, our community's safe in our interactions, and that people respect what we do out there. And I think we're on the road to making that, again, sustainable years after the consent decree in the city. Uh, I'll uh, turn a little bit of the training over to DC O'Neill and Captain Simon because they can talk more in depth on some of the things that we've done over the last uh, three and a half years. Good morning, Deputy Chief O'Neill. Good morning, Councilman and the committee. Um, we've done a lot with our training, as the Chief said. We've uh, become more involved with it, and our officers are actually responding to it. We've, uh, as the Chief said, we've had a couple bumps in the road, but we've, we've stepped up the, the instructors and their training prior to actually training the whole division. Um, I think our officers are responding to it quite well. Um, they actually enjoy coming to in-service training. We do do a lot of scenario-based training, which uh, helps them understand um, the situations they're handling out on the road. This year, we've, we've already completed our state requalification right now. Uh, we've completed that. Right now, we're working on our SEPs and um, our CIT training. No, we're working on SEPs and... Community engagement. Com and then we also have search and seizure this year and then the CIT training by the end of the year. So we'll have all that completed. Um, can, can I pause you for a minute? So you're using a lot of acronyms. Oh, sorry. STEPS training, what is that? SEPS, SEPS. Community Engagement and Problem-Oriented Policing. SEPS, okay. That's part of uh, our and CPOP plan. CPOP, and well, we already pointed out CIT is critical inter intervention training. Right. CPOP? Is Community and problem-oriented policing. Uh, right, I know all these acronyms, oh. but, but, but <laughs> yeah, right. so. So SEPS is part of yeah. <laughs> CPOP. Thank you, okay, please continue. I can't, if I continue it's to okay. say that. <laughs> it's all right, I, I'll just say pump the brakes a little and then just so, um, because there are also people watching um, uh, on TV and on the web and I wanna make sure they understand um, where the conversation's going. Understood. So please continue. So we will have that training all completed by the end of this year. A lot of this training, though, we will continue to do every year. Mm -hmm. uh, we might not have the same hours that we train every year. Uh, sometimes the Ohio Peace, uh, Peace Officers Training Commission requires us to do other training. Uh, this year they had no requirements, but next year we understand that they might be uh, adding some more requirements. Yeah, well, I, you know, 
Chief, I'll, I'll direct this comment to you. I mean, there's a, a hope on the council's part that um, assuming at some point down the road, there's gonna be no longer a consent decree, but th th this training is embedded in, in forever. I mean, we're going to continue to do it. So can you speak to that component of it? I mean, it's just when, if, if, if at some point in time, we don't know when that date is. I mm -hmm. mean, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Mr. Chair on the committee, uh, as I stated before, you know, we're doing this to make um, substantive and lasting change within the division of police, uh, within our culture, within our policies, practices, procedures, our engagement with the community, and, and long lasting, uh, like the mayor said, embedded in the DNA of, of divisional officers. Um, uh, as Joe, uh, Deputy Chief O'Neill stated, there's uh, certain required trainings uh, from OPADA. Uh, that's the agency that governs uh, police officers in the state of Ohio that we have to do. So they give us what that is. Ohio we, Police Officers so training, training Academy. Academy. OPADA. Right. OPADA, I'm sorry. It's all right. Go on. More acronym. <laughs> um, but OPADA gives us what's required uh, for that training year. So that stuff we have to put on for officers to maintain their certification as a police officer in the state. And then everything else is the stuff that we put on. Right now, uh, probably almost 100% of that is related to the settlement agreement training. Uh, the CPOP, uh, the uh, CIT, the crisis intervention, uh, our annual use of force training, things like that. But we're not gonna stop doing our CPOP training, our Fourth Amendment search and seizure training, our bias-free policing training. We're not going to stop doing that once the consent decree is over. Uh, again, that training is going to continue, and that training is going to continue to develop with best practices and as it relates to the things that happen not just here in Northeast Ohio but around the country. So our training has to evolve over the years, but we're not going to cut off uh, consent decree-related training just because we're not under the consent decree anymore. Um, Deputy Chief O'Neill, anything else you want to add? Because I'm gonna, I want to ask Captain Simon to talk a little bit about the training. Pull the mic real close. There you go. And um, give us your perspective on on, on the progress uh, that's going on right now. Sure, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. Uh, our training, uh, as DC O'Neill mentioned, has been very well accepted, um, not only by the monitoring team and the Department of Justice, but also by our members. Uh, the evaluations we receive when the officers complete the training have been nothing but positive, um, which also goes to the chief's comment that once the settlement agreement is over with, it's not something we're going to backpedal on. This training has been very effective, and the officers, as D.C. O'Neill mentioned, are enjoying going to in-service training again. Um, so it's not something we're going to backpedal on. Um, we do have search and seizure training. Um, you had specifically asked about uh, coming up in the last quarter of the year. Um, that will be completed. That's the policies that have been revised and updated uh, and approved, uh, mostly to make sure we're in compliance with the Fourth Amendment state federal laws, uh, but also to kind of address some of those communities within the city of Cleveland that may not have been specifically addressed in past policies. Um, the officers will receive training on all of that so that we can go forward and that all works together with CPOP and community engagement in order to uh, make sure the officers are approaching things as they should and within policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief, um, my last uh, topic I want you to speak to and then I'm gonna open up to questions from my colleagues. Talk about accountability. You know, big part of the consent decree is accountability, and so we're doing considerable amount of training. Um, not only training, but there needs to be accountability with making sure that that training is followed through, policies and practices are followed through, and, and Judge White, feel free to contribute anything you want to that, but can you speak to the accountability component of the yeah, consent decree? Yes, Mr. Chair and the uh, committee. Um, you know, even before this uh, consent decree process started, you know, we had accountability measures in place. Um, since the consent decree, we've added to that. Uh, we've revised uh, what we call our disciplinary guidance matrix uh, a couple times, uh, most recently this year, uh, to make sure that we comply with some of the things that have come up uh, during the last couple of years as it relates to discipline and accountability for officers within the division. Uh, you know, there's a, um, a layered approach to this within the city. Uh, citizen complaints 
uh, are filed through the Office of Professional Standards, or OPS. Uh, those complaints are investigated by OPS investigators. Uh, and again, OPS uh, is totally separate from the Division of Police. Uh, it's not under our control. It's not under our, uh, you know, org chart or anything. They're completely separate. They complete the investigations. Uh, that complete investigation goes to the uh, board. Uh, the board hears those cases, makes recommendations, decides whether or not, uh, you know, officers are guilty of the allegations against them, and then that comes to my office or a safety director's office, and we actually have a full hearing with that officer, at which time evidence is presented, testimony is taken, and then decisions made on discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, also in this entire process, um, between myself and the safety director, uh, decisions that are made can be there's an appeal process uh, mm -hmm. called uh, a grievance process uh, that may sometimes lead to an arbitration process. Uh, I know that um, our matrix, which is kind of the backbone of the accountability system for the Division of Police, our disciplinary guys matrix, has withstood multiple, multiple uh, arbitration challenges and has been held up to be a standard that we can implement and we do implement and enforce within the division. Mm -hmm. uh, that matrix sets forth uh, basically a range of discipline or corrective action for inaction or you know, actions taken by officers that are outside of policy training procedures. So officers know ahead of time if you know they commit certain offenses, this is the range of corrective action that that officer may receive. Mm -hmm. And again, that matrix has withstood several arbitration challenges as being fair and appropriate uh, for the Division of Police as far as accountability is concerned. And, and to my colleagues, I was checking my calendar. Two weeks from today, we're actually going to have the Office of Professional Standards here and, and the Civilian Police um, Review Board um, to give their perspective on this as well. Um, any, um, Judge, any other comment you want to make relative to accountability from the implementations perspective, Coordinator? Uh, just a couple, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I might. Um, one of the things the monitor team is engaged in as we speak is, uh, is an assessment uh, of the disciplinary process, so I think we're going to be concentrating on that. Uh, over the course of the next few months uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, how the hearings are held, uh, you know, outcomes, et cetera. So the, the monitor team is engaged in an assessment of the disciplinary process, which is the, the end of the accountability piece. So uh, I already talked about OPS, uh, and uh, so we should be, uh, you know, I, I have no further comments on the okay. disciplinary. Okay. Um, so l let's open up to some questions from my colleagues. Uh, again, I, I just want to remind everyone looking to adjourn this committee at 12 noon um, and we still have uh, Dr. Connor, um, Yvonne Connor, who's a co-chair of the Community Police Commission, and Mr. Goodrick, who I'm going to invite up after we do questions here. Um, so to my colleagues, I might ask you to be judicious on your full 15 minutes because I want to save time for the next panel, but I got Councilman Polensic, Joe Jones, Casey Griffin, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. Okay, Councilman Plunsett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the um, director, to the chief and command staff, and everyone, as Judge Hoyt, et cetera. Um, it's clear there has. Uh, so, Ms. Bickerstaff, uh, this was publicly noticed to get a presentation from, this is an annual check-in with the administration, okay. and then we're going to hear from the Community Police Commission after. Um, we could create an opportunity at a later date to do something like that, but it's not going to happen today. Okay, so Councilman Polensic, it was noticed for over a week in the committee calendar. No, so, yeah, it's, so, yeah. So, that, so you're saying it's not for us to ask questions? Not today. Not today. Councilman Polensic. Th thank so you. We're part of this, though. We're part of the commission. We, we participate in the meetings. We go to the meetings and we participate in the workshops within the meetings. So why can't we be a part of these questions? Ms. Bickerstaff, I'm going to have the Community Police Commission come up next, and then they're going to share a perspective of what they've heard, and I'm sure your voice is going to be represented in their comments. Mm -hmm. Councilman Polensic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to all, once again, uh, I think from what we've heard, obviously, there has been progress made from the initial, uh, when the signing took place, and um, and we can see it and in in hear it from um, 
the information and the statistics that we have received. One of the things I wanted to drill down on um, is the um, number of officers that we need to deploy on the streets. Uh, in the course of the, um, and I'm directing this to Judge White uh, and to whoever can respond, in the course of, of the review of the department and recommendations that have been made, and again, as we've heard, many of those have been implemented, was there, an, an, was there a, a specific number so identified from the standpoint that we need to deploy in, on, in this city of sworn officers? Judge White, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Councilman Flensic, uh, yes, the staffing study for the department was completed and approved by the court. Okay. Uh, the chief probably would be better versed on the exact numbers, but I think that the total number of sworn officers was 1,700, something like that. Chief, chief the, the total number is 1,610, and, and we talked at this uh, table before, and we're currently uh, at about 1,617, I think our current staffing number is. So we're over our budget at number 1610. Uh, but we've talked at this table the last couple of years about that 1700 number. Um, but again, you know, it took us a year and a half, uh, almost two years to get to that 1600 number from 1545. And it's going to take us another couple of years, if approved uh, by the administration and council, to get to a 1700 number. So the ultimate goal is 1700. But, you know, we can't get to 1,700 overnight. So we're a little over 1,610 now. Uh, we need to be able to maintain that consistently with attrition, as this body knows. And then once we can get to that point, then we're going to try to strive to get over that with approval, again, from the administration and council. So the chief indicated the, the number is 17. Uh, but is that is that the number that you that the monitor suggests as well? Seventeen hundred. That's the number that's in the staffing plan that's been approved by the monitor okay. and the courts. Okay, and that's to maintain it that seventeen number as we go forward for the years to come. I, the staffing plan isn't stretched out over a period okay. of decades. But, no, but that that's the goal. Okay, the um, the point of community policing. You've alluded to it in your comment, 20% uh, of their time, and you mentioned something about four hours or something I, in your presentation. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, Council Plessig, I don't remember mentioning something about four hours, but 20% uh, is the goal, and you know we have a plan to implement that through through the department. So yeah. uh, starting with patrol, I mean that you know okay. some of the special units, and the, again, right. the, I understand that can't do that, but. Uh, the goal is 20% of, of patrol time to get started in puny engagement and problem solving in a combination so, of those two things. In the course of a shift, how many hours is that? Well, give, me some, give me some time frame. What does that I'm represent? I'm going to let the chief address that. If you know. uh, well, it, we run eight-hour shifts on days and then 10-hour shifts on uh, E platoon and C platoon, afternoons and midnights. Right. Uh, so, like the judge said, the goal is to get to that 20% of an officer's time uh, during those two time frames. Uh, it, and 10-hour shift is two hours. So, two hours of an officer's entire shift should be community engagement, although we know that's not going to happen every single day with every single officer. So, what's going to happen is... Uh, and, and we haven't really set the parameters as to how we're going to get to that 20%. Uh, is it going to be on a weekly basis, a daily basis, a quarterly basis, things like that we still have to work out because we're still working out how to actually capture and be able to quantify that 20%. Um, what our officers are doing now is as much community engagement and problem solving as possible, even without the plan being in place, uh, because these are the things that we do every day. So we're looking for that 20% once this thing gets up and running, knowing that that's not going to happen with every officer every single day. Okay. So I guess my, my concern and my question is, and you've just alluded to it, is, how, what, is the, what is the measuring stick? How do we define it? Um, I've always had a, um, a good relationship working with people in the 5th District, and that's, it's been ongoing. So I talk to officers all the time. And they just don't see that, at this point, they don't see that happening because they're running the calls for service. That's what they're doing. That's what I hear from when they come to neighborhood meetings 
and we engage them at a public meeting as we did last week at the Collinwood Rec Center, um, what do we hear? They are running the calls for service. So I, so if, if I'm running to a call for service and I get out of my car and I approach somebody and I'm talking to them, is that community engagement? See, I don't, that to me is not a community engagement. That's responding to a call for service. The way I define community engagement is being able to get out and talk to people in a non-confrontational situation, a non-call for service, just getting out and talking to people, engaging, getting to know the community, getting to know people in it. So I, I'm really concerned about that because I just don't see how that is, how that is going to happen and how we're going to measure it. Now, if, it, if you're going to make it a part of the run, I guess then maybe, you know, as, as throughout the day, you could say that's community engagement. But from the standpoint of the citizens that I engage, they want to be able to get to know the officers. They want to have a partnership. They don't want this. So often, I think the police have been looked upon as an occupational force in the community. And we have got to get totally away from that if we're going to, again, as the chief indicated and others, gain the respect of the community, get them engaged with the, the police. So it isn't adversarial. They, we're all in this together. Um, and that's something that we continue to stress in our neighborhood of working with the police officers, working with our commander, being engaged. If you see something, say something. You know, to have that kind of relationship. So when you when people hear the C C pop, they don't really know what it means. They don't have an eye they're not even clear what it means. They knew what the mini station program was or they knew what this was, but they don't know they're not clear what the C pop program is and how they can interact with police officers. So uh, to me, you know I've been here a long time, and I think, you know, we've got to figure out, oh, excuse me, we've got to figure out how we're going to build bridges, how we're going to build bridges between our citizens, because there is a division. Anyone thinks there isn't, they're wrong. There is division out there in the community, especially with many of the young people. And I engage, I listen to them. You know, I was at the... Um, I was at the Glenville Rec Center some time ago talking, encouraging, trying to encourage some young men to sign up, take the test for police officers. And, I, you know, I was listening to their comments and their opinions and their thoughts uh, about the police. And some, um, some of the comments were positive and some were not positive. Um, and it was interesting at the end of the day when I asked them, um, and two of them were, Two of them were graduates of CSU, and two were, um, uh, they were just up there playing basketball. And, and um, it's funny, at the end of the day, when I got through time when I asked them, you know, would they consider um, <laughs> taking a test or at least looking into it? And their general comment was, uh, no, they didn't want to do it because it was too dangerous. <laughs> okay, so here we are. I mean, um, you're trying to, we're trying to get a department that is reflective of the community, um, and yet here's four young men who really, I think, had talents and could have really served our city well, but their perception was, besides their own personal comments and views, that they just thought the job was too dangerous, and they didn't. They were not going to. They were not going to, you know, take the test or even apply to take the right. test. So we got to get over that as well. I yes. mean, it's all a part. Brief, brief, yeah. brief response yeah. from yeah. the administration. Yeah, just real quick. Chief. Two, two points, real quick. Uh, Councilman, you're right. That 20 percent. Uh, it is a, um, a high bar, but that 20% is both community engagement as well as problem solving. So that call for service could end up being a little bit of both. It okay. could end up being a problem solving at the end if that is a persistent and chronic call for service. Okay. And the officers are to engage in problem solving to make sure that we don't have to keep coming back to that address for the same issue. Uh, on the point with the recruitment, um, you know, we're, we have an excellent recruitment team here in public safety. Uh, we have, uh, as we talked about um, earlier this year, have met our recruitment numbers uh, when a lot of agencies can't. Uh, you know, I, I uh, encourage those young men to reach out to an officer that they see out there to come to a community meeting to get more information. Uh, law enforcement is a dangerous job. It is. There's no, no ifs and buts about it. But the judge talked about our use of force stats and how they're down. I talked about our officer-involved shootings and how we haven't had one in almost two years. Um, where other cities, I, I get the, 
the news briefs and, and the chief's updates on a daily basis where all these other cities are having shooting after shooting after shooting, officers killed, unfortunately, uh, in the line of duty and things like that. And I think a lot of the things that we're doing here in the city are working because we, you know, uh, thank God, knock on wood, sure. uh, haven't had some of those things happen in the last couple of years. And I think it's due to the hard work of a lot of folks in and out of this room. No, Judge Wait, hold on, Judge okay. Wait, want to make a brief response. Right. And, and so to, to, to yeah. my colleagues at the Mr. I want my colleagues to get as much time as possible to yep. ask questions. Short responses. Yep. I just, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a, a response that the, the relationship between the recruiting plan and the staffing plan is is, is very complementary to CPOP, and we recognize that that it is a staffing issue. Uh, right. You know, to be able to reach the goals that we want to reach, uh, so uh, the, uh, progress is being made under those plans as well to complement yeah. the CPOP. No, I think th I think the the um, the uh, the command staff uh, has done a, a very good job of trying to. Um, market the department, um, especially to make it more reflective of the city. I mean, that's clear. I mean, to reach out to different organizations and groups and the officers that have been out there um, trying to encourage individuals to at least inquire about the job. And, um, and, and, and again, I, I, I see that improvement from my time here, where there was virtually no reach out in day to the point where you know, it's, people are talking about it in the churches, pastors are talking about it, there's, there's brochures, there's pamphlets, there's folks coming out to encourage people to become engaged in the Cleveland Police Department. So I, I've seen all that, and I think that's been very positive. I just, I just want to see the, uh, I want to see greater, greater bonds built in the community, because with those bonds, Everything you just alluded to, that's going to continue to diminish. The problems, the complaints, we're going to, we're, our officers are going to, they're going to be a source of intelligence. Because once people feel that they can trust. trust that officer or they like that officer, you'd be surprised what they're going to find out what's happening in the neighborhood. That's so you're going to see a big impact on what's going on in our neighborhood. So I'm, I'm supportive of that. And I just, yeah, and it's like anything. I, I, I want to see more police on the street, and I want to see more community engagement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And you know he took every note down when you said 1,700 officers. That's going to come up at every <laughs> committee meeting after. Yeah, we need it. <laughs> Councilman Joe Jones. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, the judge, Greg White, uh, talked about a number of points in his presentation, and I was trying to, as fast as I could jot down as, as much as I possibly could. But it was really interesting to see that um, he said that and I want to make sure I'm, I'm hearing this correctly, that we're a national model, and if you could elaborate on that. Well, I, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Councilman, uh, I think the Monitor six-month report over the, the last two or three reporting periods has really uh, been very complementary of the city's uh, crisis intervention plan. Uh, and the crisis intervention training that has taken place. So uh, there's no question that, uh, that they have uh, classified the effort that's been made here in Cleveland as a model for the nation in terms of dealing with that particular uh, problem. Uh, can can you community. give us an example, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. White? Well, the example is, you know, we have the, the Mental Health Re uh, Advisory C Committee, right, through uh, the, the Adams Board. Uh, and that, that, that committee is made up of a cross-section of professionals on various e uh, levels that have been uh, actively advising the city on, you know, how to deal with folks in crisis that they come in contact with. Uh, so I think our Adams Board model, our policies itself, and the quality of training uh, are examples of that. And, and Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. White. Um, the, the, the assessment of, um, do we have maybe, because it would be good to have this in writing, if all possible, some of the, your testimony about the progress of where we are right now, currently. Do we have that available, Mr. Chairman, to the director, I mean to the chief? You're somebody in your report, you want to, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what the question is. The question was, um, like, he'd like to hear from in your perspective, is there a document in writing, a kind of a real snapshot in time where we're at? Sure. I would refer you, uh, Councilman, to the Monitor six-month report that was filed on March the 4th. Is it possible if you could make that available? Is that, yeah, that, that incorporate? I'll, I'll have John James email that out to right. everyone today. But, but does that incorporate what you share with us today? Yes. I, I see. And then we, but in addition to that, sir, I would also refer you to 
our own six-month report, which was recently filed by uh, the law department, and uh, perhaps Mr. Singletary can address that. But, but so we, we each file six-month reports, and ours is kind of a response to the monitor's report. But, uh, you know, these reports from the monitor have been getting progressively positive for the city, I guess is the, is the bottom line I'm trying to emphasize here today. But uh, it's, it's an extensive report. It's about 100 pages long. Uh, but it's got, uh, you know, kind of evaluations in every area that we're required to meet in the consent decree. And, and, Mr. and Mr. Chairman, to uh, Judge White, does it also talk about, would you also explain your testimony, the new frontier of data? Yes. Uh, you know, it, it does talk about what, how we need to progress in terms of our data. Uh, and uh, I, I believe it's fair to say that uh, both of our reports kind of cover that area, the, the city and the market. <coughs> And, and the, is, in your, the, how many, uh, how does that break down? Is this, is it certain categories of data that you're looking to collect? Is it a, is it 23 points or 25 different bits of data or is it a lot more than that? Uh, I uh, think just I give me an ideal to kind of get that just to what does that mean? I believe there are 370 data points in the consent decree and a, a couple of paragraphs that, that we need to gather. Uh, there was an initial assessment of what we would refer to as the baseline back in 2016 about what of those, how many of those data points we actually had information on. Uh, and so our goal has been to, to build that, uh, build upon that so that we are touching all the bases that we need to touch to be able to establish that we're, we are in compliance. Hey, Councilman, if I could, report, could, Mr. Chairman. Could, could we have Mr. Singletary add to that statement? Yes. Mr. Singletary. Uh, to the chairman, uh, with regards to data collection. Data collection, and then as well as, um, uh, yeah, data collection. Um, to go back to the original point, uh, we do publish a report, we file a report uh, with the court in the form of a pleading, which is our six month report. Uh, we actually filed one initially the first year of the consent decree, which was number one, even before the monitor was really involved. And so we've been on a sort of a two to four week delay after the monitor files his report. We then file a report. Any member of the panel that might wish, uh, we have seven of these reports now. Uh, they're roughly 25 to 30 pages long. They're, uh, if you looked at them in sequence, you'd get uh, sort of a in time, I believe, as you were indicating, a view of where we were seven reports ago, what the city had accomplished, and then each one sort of succeeds going forward as to what we've accomplished in that period, where the focus will be going forward. And so those can certainly be made available as a, a reference point. With regards to data, uh, that was, uh, it's a very important part of the consent decree. A lot of negotiation went into uh, how that would be reviewed. And what uh, we now have is a, a, a data coordinator. Uh, so, so why don't you quickly re wrap this session up, and because I don't want to take any oh, sure. time away from it. I apologize. Uh, basically, uh, what we're in now is, the, I think as the judge discussed, our data folks are working with the monitor's data folks to actually come up with how this is collected now that we're in a more computerized field. I get that, Mr. Chairman, um, and I don't mean to be rude. Just we have so much time here, and you're explaining a process that is not doesn't deal with the line of questioning I have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, to um, the Chief, uh, to the uh, uh, Mr. White, the 370 data points uh, that you were talking about in terms of collection, uh, is that also mentioned in your plan exactly what those 370 points are in terms of their title and why you're collecting it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the Councilman, they're, they're in the consent decree. Uh, and there, I could refer you to a particular paragraph in the consent decree, but not off the top of my head as I sit here. But, uh, you know, the, the monitors has all, have also done assessments of uh, all those data points, that, uh, and that's an electronic form, I think, that, that was done a couple years ago that we can probably if, if make If we could make that available, because we're talking about it, and I don't know about it, because I wasn't okay. here when you initially sure. put it all together. So I'm, I'm kind of playing catch up, and sure some of our other colleagues are new uh, on all of the minutiae of right. all this whole process. 
process because it's quite uh, daunting uh, when you when we're just sitting here right now and you're mentioning acronyms and I appreciate the chairman uh, asking you to uh, clarify exactly what you're saying. So not only uh, uh, does the city of Cleveland don't know, but this councilman don't know all the bits and pieces that you're doing because we don't have that information so that's why i'm requesting it so mr chairman if we could ha have the honorable mr white if we could get those 370 points that you're referencing uh, in terms of um the purpose of collecting that data would be important um and it'd be important for me to know and, and kind of like understand this this entire process where we are what what we're planning on doing from this point and and where we, how we will look in the, in the future as a city as it relates to all the training that we we've been here talking about. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, swinging over to uh, community policing plan, uh, um, d do we have uh, that plan available so that we can see it? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman, I, uh, we do. Uh, we have the, the recruit plan, the staffing plan, and the uh, CPOP plan, the community can, can policing plan. Can we make plan. that available Certainly. to the council, Mr. Chairman? Uh, and then we'll, John James? Yeah, we'll get it to you. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. White. And, the, and that would also, you, you mentioned something about bias-free data. Could you explain that? Well, it, it, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Councilman, the, the, we have bias-free policies uh, that uh, have been approved. And we're but there is data associated with correct. engagement that correct. you do have to collect, and that's so, the question he's So the asking. question is interaction with the community in terms of uh, investigative stops or uh, arrests based upon reasonable suspicion and or probable cause, uh, how those interactions are documented, uh, how the, the uh, supervisors uh, uh, review the information that's entered as a result of those community engagements, uh, and uh, that's all subject to being captured uh, and assessed by the monitor team, the DOJ, and ultimately the court. And Mr. Chairman, thank you to Mr. White. The, you also talked about manuals for Office of Standards, Internal Affairs manuals, and the annual report on the dissent decree, which we're going to get that. Um, do we, can we make those manuals available, Mr. Chairman, to our, to our, our committee? We, we can make the, OP, the Office of Professional Standards manual available. We can make the Police Review Board manual available. Uh, uh, we are, have not finalized yet the FIT manual and the Internal Affairs manual, but that's going to happen soon. Okay. Uh, and as soon as that's done, then I'm sure that those will be posted on the city website and made uh, widely available. Right. Can we just, you know, I don't, it, as soon as you have it available, can we get a copy of it here for the council for distribution? Mm -hmm. Because, I, you know, I don't want to try to pick my brain going to a web page and hoping I got the no, information. No, we, so yes. I would hope that we would just make that as a matter of courtesy to the council. Uh, that information because I know that the city has paid a lot of money into dissent decree and we would like to have the access right directly from the horse's mouth and so if you could make that available I'd be appreciative Mr. Chairman to uh, Judge White. The, the, the piece on um, resolving the last 144 officers at, or 44 cases that you have in the process and you talked about um, be more specific 44 cases th what? there was the, the I guess apparently there's 144 cases they're still being worked upon uh, Mr. Chairman and Council and for the OPS backlog the Office of Professional Standard mm -hmm. backlog that we uh, sent and contracted with Hillard Hines to clear up mm -hmm. there are 144 cases remaining for them to resolve out of 380 that we originally sent. And so after this is all said and done with, and how do, will we still, if this is all resolved, do we have a process and mechanism in place to keep us up uh, versus falling behind? Mr. Chairman, again, the Councilman, uh, we do. Uh, the, and I think I referred last time I was here to the Office of Professional Standards biweekly report that they file uh, and the, through the uh, safety director's office that has uh, a, a, a every two weeks we get an update as to where the OPS is at with the, with the cases that were filed after December 1st of 2017. Those are the ones that, that, uh, that they uh, remain current on. I, uh, and I don't have those numbers off the top but of my head. But in two weeks, Judge, we're going to have them here right. two weeks okay. from today, and we're going to be able to go into detail about where we're at in real time. Well, Mr. Councilman. Chairman, I really appreciate the work that uh, Mr. Judge White has, has been doing uh, and, and making his presentations. Uh, <coughs> and it would, you know, certainly, I, you know, 
appreciate it. This councilman, you know, get the reports, have an opportunity to review them. Uh, and then in, in the future, when we're having these sessions, if you have information ahead of time, it'd be good to review that so that I will uh, be more prepared and can ask you the more appropriate questions necessary as it relates to the subject matter that we're dealing with. And um, Mr. Chairman, um, I wanted to focus over to Mr. to Chief Williams. Um, there was a, just listening here, um, you said that you're working to, with the, the, the policing plan, the new community policing plan to, to develop and establish trust in the neighborhood. And that if uh, we don't get that, um, that trust from the neighborhood, the neighborhood doesn't trust us, that we'll have some issues. And I just wanted you to elaborate, uh, Mr. Chairman, to Chief Williams, what, what are those issues you were referring to? Uh, through the chair of the councilman, my comment was that if we, uh, we can have the uh, best use of force policies and things like that and have everything in line with policies, training, the Constitution, uh, have that use of force be totally justified, but if the community doesn't trust us, then we can still have issues with the community on that use of force issue itself. And it's happened around the country where there have been officer-involved shootings or uses of force by a police officer that were totally within policy, but if that relationship with the community isn't what it should be, then the community is still going to be upset about that and voice their displeasure with that use of force, even though that use of force was proper. That was my comment. And so how, Mr. Chairman, uh, what we how are we going about developing that trust? What, that, what does that mean in terms of a practical approach? Well, it's part of our CPOP plan. Uh, it's part of what officers do out there every day. It's part of what Councilman Polinsic talked about as far as officers getting to know the people within the communities that they serve. Uh, and we do that day in and day out. Uh, I'm sure at the uh, Councilman's meeting at uh, Collinwood Rec Center the other night, there were police officers there talking to the people that actually live in that Collinwood neighborhood. That's a part of our CPOP plan. Our community engagement officers, our mobile citizens police academy officers that we recently introduced here um, about a month ago, that their job is to go out and show people and tell people and talk to people about how this division works and how they can be involved in how the division works. Uh, our officers day in and day out that go out and play football with kids and, you know, try to save people's lives that have been the victims of crime and violent crime. Uh, I mean, things like that every day. Um, but you'll get a copy of our CPOP plan, our community and problem oriented policing plan that further spells out specifics on how we do that day in and day out. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, um, looking here, there's a lot of training that apparently has been going on, and I, and I presume how many training, you know, different classes, different subject matters have we been taking our officers through? Is it, because I, I heard a lot about training and um, all sorts of types of training. So I didn't know if it was one training class, 12 training classes, or 30 training classes we've been, and so what those training classes can you, do. Can you briefly respond to that? We're at 15 minutes, I wanna get other. And then I, two more and then I'll be. Well, I can put you back on the list, Councilman, you're at 15 minutes I'll, right I'll, now. I'll, you're at 15 minutes now. Um, briefly, the components to training. Through the chair to the councilman, the components of training, we have about five to six different classes that we take them through. Uh, we have our state recall every year. Uh, we're gonna be teaching on search and seizure, crisis intervention, community policing, bias-free uh, policing, am I missing? Use of force. And community engagement and use of force. Use of force. force. And, and is that a part of the dissent decree or is that, is that normal training? To the chair to the councilman, the state requalification is mandated by the state, and the rest of it is through the consent decree. I see, and and uh, I'll be thank you, Mr. Counsel. Chairman. And if you could, if there's time on the back end. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Councilman Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to uh, Director Lang Henry, 526 days from now will be October 2nd, 2020, which is when the contract with the monitors, I believe, uh, is up. And today we've heard. Um, things like major plans have been completed, and to quote Judge White, not in substantial compliance. Now, we know that um, the five-year contract with the monitors does not coincide with the actual consent decree. 
Um, so how, I think Judge White said that we had to be in substantial compliant for two years, and that is um, determined by whom? The monitor in the court. The monitor is an agent of the court. Right. And so so it, ultimately it's the court that makes that, that determination. That, that was my question. So it's Judge Oliver, correct? Judge Solomon Oliver, right. yes. So at some point after reading all the reports and everything from the city and the monitors, at some point does Judge Oliver say, okay, the city of Cleveland is in substantial compliant or at least compliant? Will, will, will that at some point happen? Yes. Okay. And then the, the question with that is, I mean, and I, I would assume that the answer was, was going to be yes, and we would hope that it would be yes. <clears throat> At that point, um, two years following whenever that ruling would be, Mr. Chairman, to, to the director, um, is, that when, is that when we would be out from underneath? I don't, want to, I don't want to say the consent decree, but I want to say under the um, auspices of the monitors. Um. Currently, as you said, there's a five-year contract for the monitor. Correct. The consent decree allows that to be continued for one year, for two one-year periods. And it's the judge who makes the decision whether the monitor stays. Separate from that is the judge's determination of whether we're in full and substantial compliance. Okay. And um, so it's, it's up to the judge to make that determination of where we are and whether there's still a need for the monitor to continue to work with us. Um, or not. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, to, to Judge White, I'm assuming you've studied other consent decrees across the nation. Has there ever been a situation that you're aware of, or, or even you, Director, where um, the federal judge would say, yes, we're in compliant, we're not at the two years, we see that the progress has been made, we believe that the city is going to continue to be compliant, keep us under a consent decree, but without the monitors? Um, Mr. Chairman, Councilman, I'm not aware of a city where the uh, court has suggested that uh, because of substantial compliance uh, within the, the time frame of the consent decree that there was no need for a monitor. I would, uh, however, uh, suggest that the uh, cost associated with that uh, is, is a front end loaded process, I believe, so that in, uh, the, uh, the intensity of that monitoring uh, would certainly be less. Uh, through that process would would uh, be my hope, and I and I think that that uh, you know I look to Seattle for instance as as possibly where uh, that all goes, and they're right. like three years ahead of us in this process. Yet they have they have been ruled to be in substantial compliance, but they're still under the the uh, consent decree in Seattle at this point. All right, um, and then Mr. Chairman to to the um, to the law director and and to the chairman some point in October, sometime around 2020, a year from now or whatever, the monitors or, or, or the, the law department or, or Judge White's gonna have to come back before council to um, extend that contract? Is, is, will so that here, I, yeah, yeah, no, I'll give you my perspective. Um, ultimately, and, and Director Langhander is correct, uh, come October of 2020, um, there's only one person who can make that determination, that's Judge Oliver. If Judge Oliver determines <clears throat> that they want the monitor in place for another year, let's assume, um, at that point, we will have to appropriate legislation to authorize funding to pay for one year of compliant, or uh, one year of having the monitor around. Um, but we won't know that until um, Judge Oliver makes that determination. At that point, either way, makes a determination that the monitor can go away or the monitor sticks around, I'm going to request, because uh, I know the monitor does not like to come before this council, I'm going to request, request in writing to Judge Oliver that we get the monitor here so we can hear from the monitor in the monitor's perspective about where we're at. All Please right. continue. But, but there is a chance, we won't put a percentage on it, that Judge Oliver could say in October of 2020, you guys have done a stellar job. You've completely turned everything around, and there's no need for the city of Cleveland to be under a consent decree or to be monitored. 
could. That could, could be said. I mean, that 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 That's would what be they're hoping for. That would be my goal. <laughs> but um, all right. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilman Blaine Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to piggyback on my colleague Councilman Casey's uh, comments. Um, I do believe in watching these consent decrees across the country, Seattle, Baltimore, I think Albuquerque and a couple of other ones have extended consent decrees. So it's not a lot of instances where there is actually been five years and out. Um, mm -hmm. It's always traditionally, to be honest with you, um, um, extended. But a lot of that. But I would say in most of those scenarios, as you know, Councilman, that's where those cities f fought it every step of the way. Right. We voluntarily said yes. We welcomed them DOJ. We voluntarily entered into this. But please continue. Mr. Chairman, if, you know, if I may, that's where I was going oh, with I'm this. Oh, I'm sorry. Is bad. that basically sorry. Um, this city had a more ambitious consent decree yeah. than other cities. Yes, sir. And in a shorter period of time has been able to. Um, demonstrate a lot of success in a shorter period of time than some of those other cities do to those cities uh, stringing them out. Um, I, I, I will say to my colleague Councilman Kay's question, which is something I'm trying to understand, there are portions of the consent decree that I believe in reading the report that seems that we are compliant with. Uh, if there are portions of that consent decree that we are compliant with, does the monitor still have to keep all of those components of the team that they have? Can the team, can the judge make that decision or who makes that decision on how that team may be paired back? For example, if we've accomplished use of force or some of these other uh, agenda items, CPOP or anything else, do we still need that subject matter expert Direct, as part of that monitor Director team? or judge? I, the, um, as the judge said, um, from, through the chair to the councilman, uh, the consent decree was front loaded, and so the team they wouldn't use those folks if there's no need for them. So um, I don't know that the judge would say you're not on the team anymore. They just won't be billing for them because there won't be anything for them to do. And that's 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 great. That's great to hear because that's kind of what I want to understand is that. You know, I think what everybody is really the underlying question is how long are we going to have to pay how much for the monitor? And I think as this council deliberates budget and everything else that we would like to use those dollars for other line items, we'd like to see that budget or that line item decrease over a period of time. So just that'd be good to know. Um, I will, um, you know, just uh, a couple of things that I am interested in. I know that search and seizure as well as bias free police leasing was not part of the DOJ's findings. However, we did agree in the consent decree that we would examine those. I'm curious if in examining those, if we looked at the leads, um, the leads process, how, you know, um, police officers run license plates of people who they see in areas, you know, for leads data and if we've examined those kind of things or anything else. Chief or judge, anyone? Chief. Yeah, through the chair to councilman, uh, not specifically, uh, but there is a, um, a, a protocol for leads uh, that we have to abide by in order to maintain our lead status uh, with the state of Ohio. Uh, so if officers are in violation of that, then leads themselves will send that notification to us and then we take action with those officers. Um, but I think your point is, have we audited uh, certain officers or officers throughout the division for things that they do within the lead system? And we don't do a periodic audit. Uh, I think our leads coordinator does a random audit just to make sure people are in compliance. But, you know, that's something we could take a look at. Okay, that's good to know because I know that there's, you know, a lot of people in the public realm, especially a lot of civil rights activists that really look at the leads as a, a source of bias um, policing. And that's something that I know that may not have been captured in the consent decree, but it's something that I definitely think impacts it. And I don't know if everybody knows what leads are, or if the public audience knows, but Chief, if you could just give a very brief synopsis on what leads is so that people sure. know what we're talking about. Yeah, through the uh, chair of the councilman, uh, leads is a uh, database. Uh, it stands for law enforcement automatic, automated data systems. And uh, it basically, um, 
has within it all the information uh, related to a person's vehicle registration and driver's license. Uh, there's also information within leads that uh, if warrants are issued for people, then that alert is put in the leads, that warrant's put in the leads. So anything on a person that relates to their driving status, uh, their driver's license, uh, any warrants or things like that uh, are contained in the lead system and an officer can run that person through leads to get that information back. And thank you, Chief. And the reason that I wanted you to you know, bring it up and the reason that I link it to bias is because if an officer is in Buckeye, let me just use my area, and they may be running license plates of just because they can run it on any citizen, anybody mm -hmm. um, that are in the area, you know, it, there's always civil rights um, impacts when you look at those kind of tools. But I know it's definitely a tool that law enforcement needs in order to be safe, in order to understand when they make stops. But yes. I just been curious if you guys have really examined that system and making sure that we're compliant and also making sure that it's not any unintended uh, bias happening mm -hmm. in that process. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I know that the, um, and I, I wanna be very, very uh, cognizant to respect the uh, chief's process as I, as, I, as I ask this. But I know that 15 officers or probably 17 officers in the academy um, didn't make it through, to, I think, the class before last or something like that. And a majority of those officers, I'm not sure, I've, I've heard different numbers have been um, African American. And one of the things I do with other agencies that are in Ward 6 and throughout the community, I really, try to understand their culture as they're having people that go through training. And I'm really trying to understand, even though I know that that's police business that we um, have to keep our separation, but really interested if the monitor is, is looking at the culture of who makes it through the academy and what barriers can cause some of those officers not to make it through the academy, because clearly that impacted the amount of minorities and people that we could have had on the force because we lost such a large component of them. And I'm not sure if it was just a cultural thing or if it was rules and we didn't do um, some things to make sure that they understood some of the things they needed to deal with before they went in there. But I'm trying to be respectful of not interfering with any other grievance process, but do we, have we examined that process of training as, as these officers go through the academy? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. To the chair, to the councilman, uh, yes, we have. We do that on a consistent basis. Um, I'm not going to get deep into the uh, 15. There were actually 15 uh, cadets that were dismissed from the academy uh, because there is pending uh, litigation on this. Um, but everybody that enters the academy is held to the uh, same standard uh, regardless uh, because they all have to perform the same way uh, out there for the community. And I, I can tell you uh, that uh, our academy is probably the best in the state, period. And I can tell you that our academy uh, does a great job in turning out Cleveland police officers. And I, I just kind of have to leave it at that. So. Thank you, Chief. And, and you know, all I, I think as we examine processes, which lead to my end question, is that, um, you know, what Mayor Jackson has always said is that we also want to make sure that we, um, that this process is not just about um, relationships between the police community, but also are we a safer city? Yes. And, have we looked at the data to correlate if we're actually safer as a community as a result of this consent decree? And that's something that we can take back to our communities to actually say this consent decree has been helpful in us reducing solve rates, helpful in us reducing um, you know, use of force, as you mentioned, knock on wood. I, I, always, I always tell everybody we've gone a couple of years without some of those issues. Um, but you know, is there any kind of data correlating that safety versus when the consent decree came in place? Uh, to the chair of the councilman, uh, I'll let uh, the, the DC and the captain speak a little bit more on that. I don't think we've actually looked at how the consent decree affects crime itself. Uh, the judge talked about some of the stats as it relates to use of force and injuries, uh, how that affects both officers and civilians uh, in that process. Um, but uh, when I came to this table back in January, February, and we talked about the staffing, um, you know, I kind of gave you, you know, our staffing is based on those three criteria, reduction of violent crime, community engagement, and then compliance with the settlement agreement. Uh, so we really don't correlate the two except for that we're in compliance with it 
but it does help, uh, I think, the policies that we put in place and the training and the tactics do help with our officers out there and their engagement with the community. That's, I take that. That's fine. Right. The only thing that I do want, and I know that, and you know, Councilman, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, because I have such a personal relationship with these ladies, and and and, you know, I've, I've gotten to know them very well over the year, and how passionate they are about their community, um, you know. Um, you know, with uh, some of the folks that we have in the audience today, Ms. Bickerstaff and um, everybody else, um, you know, uh, Ms. Rice and uh, Ms. Miller and everybody else, um, um, Angela, I always call her Angela. But uh, the uh, only thing I will say um, is that sometimes we do need to let the public know how the change has been made, what we might have been doing differently then, or what, what we might have been doing wrong then, and what we're doing differently now. Because I think that that change has not been articulated well. And it will help people understand and their advocacy as they come to the table and as they come to community meetings and be involved to show how their efforts as community activists have changed some of the things that might have happened then and how we're doing things different now. So I really look forward and really trying to help articulate that because um, we have to, you know, recommend, you know, recognize when people really are citizens that are really trying to come to the table and advocate for change. So I hope we can continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Bashir Jones. Thank you, Chair. And just to follow up with what uh, Councilman Griffin said, I, I believe the same that any time community shows up, there should be a space for them to speak, especially when they've suffered the loss of their loved ones. So even if we have to move things around, we should. I have a couple of questions, um, Chair, Chair, to uh, the Chief. And um, let me first by say, first state that um, we are appreciative of any growth that happens in our city. Um, we are thankful for it. Um, it's a blessing. And even though we use the data, you know, for me, my data is the residents. Um, this is good. The numbers you said, Chair, to Judge Judge White, about the fifteen thousand and three hundred and. It shows that this number is going down, but for that one person, yeah, for them, it doesn't matter how much it has decreased. For them, it means everything. Um, so the data for me is the, is the residents, you know, and for them, um, some things haven't changed. And, um, and it's imperative, as Councilman Griffin said, that we're able to express this to them so that we can show that there has been some changes and there's still some ways to go. Um, chair to, to, the, to the chief, um, chief, do you, do you believe that the police department represents the demographics of this city? And if, and if, if yes, why? And if not, why? Uh, through the chair to councilman, uh, if you're talking raw numbers, no. I mean, the city is majority African-American, and our division is about 38, 39 percent minority. Right. When you say minority, what do you mean? Hispanic, African-American, yes. Right. So and why do you think that is, Chair? And why, why do you think that is, Chair to the Chief? Uh, through the Chair to the uh, Councilman, uh, I don't think I have that answer. If I had that answer, you know, uh, uh, I think the numbers would be a lot better. I mean, that's what we constantly try to do uh, is to increase our uh, diversity within the division, period. Right. And it's not that diverse at the moment. Does the con chair to, to, to the judge, do, do you think that the consent decree, does it discuss the percentage of officers who must be hired? Does it talk about that? Is there a, um, is it something that puts that in place that a certain percentage of officers that are coming in must reflect the community in which no. they're serving. There's, there's no quotas or anything like that in the consent decree. That, you know, the, the law department has been uh, uh, articulate on that subject, I think, uh, more than anything. But there is a goal, obviously, uh, and to reflect the community. Yeah. And that is uh, the, the purpose of the recruiting plan. Uh, and I, I, the chief had mentioned earlier that uh, 
there has been a great deal of work and progress yeah. uh, under the recruiting plan uh, and the, you know, Sergeant Leon and the leadership through the entire Department of Public Safety, but particularly the police department. Yes, yeah, the, your, your, uh, the Cleveland recruitment team, they've been doing a phenomenal job. I, I've really been enjoying the community engagement officers. They've been amazing. Um, but just to go back to the data, does the numbers show that the recruitment has helped, has worked? Uh, through the chair, Councilman, uh, yeah, I, I think it does. Uh, I think we started this with about a 29 percent, 29, 30 percent minority um, staffing within the division, and now we're almost 40. So, you know, our current, uh, we have two academy classes in session now of over 106 total officers, and I think they're about 40 uh, percent African American and Hispanic. Right. So, Chief, I think it's working. Me, Councilman Chief, also speak yes. to your leadership team. How well, I, I mean, leadership. you know, the executive officer for the division, second in command, is a female. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know people don't uh, count females, whether African American, Caucasian, or otherwise, as minorities anymore. But, uh, I mean, we are, I think, we're a diverse police division. Uh, is there a need level. for yeah, deputy chiefs, uh, you know, uh, one Hispanic deputy chief, two African-American deputy chiefs, and deputy chief O'Neill. And let me be clear that uh, so, just because a, a person is a specific color does not necessarily make them a great officer. So I do want to <laughs> well, make great. that I'm crystal clear. That, I, yes, I, I do believe that. Yes, sir. But, but it's hard to come up with those, uh, that reality if it's not, uh, if the chance hasn't even been given. Uh, given yet to 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 express that, but no, you're, you're correct, uh, and I'm really excited about our new commander uh, in the fifth district. So I love to see more more women who are taking those positions. I think it would make things a lot better. But I guess my specific question is about the percentage of officers, um, minority officers, uh, in communities. Um, I'm really interested in seeing those numbers. And, and um, so, uh, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is, um, Chair to the judge, does the decree discuss the hiring and firing process? And how supportive have you found the union to be with this consent decree or the implementation of it? Well, the, the consent decree doesn't discuss hiring and firing necessarily outside the context of recruitment and accountability. Mm -hmm. and those are the issues. Uh, so, you know, the... the uh, Mr. Chairman, can I Mr. White pull the, the thing sorry, up? Yes, just as I mentioned earlier, the monitor team is, in, is currently doing an assessment of uh, the disciplinary process uh, and studying the cases uh, over the course of the last couple of years. So right. I have and that's more my, information about that. Yes, sir. And that's, and that's really my question. So the decree doesn't do it, but we, we are clear that there have been officers who... Uh, who have come from different places, who've had disciplinary problems from different places, but they've been able to come and become officers within Cleveland. So my question is... To the is chair that, of the councilman, I don't chair? think that's chair correct. Chair? That's not correct? No. Okay. So no. we've never had officers who have had problems elsewhere and they were able to become Cleveland officers? To the chair of the councilman, uh, I think you'd have to give us a to specific... The chair, please. I think you'd have to give us a specific... Uh, name uh, of that officer that came from elsewhere and you'd have to give us a specific time frame I'm talking in the last uh, three and a half years uh, with what we've done re recruitment hiring within no, no, the division. Chief, Chair so. to the Chief, I I'm not speaking about in the since the consent decree no I understand that part I'm okay. saying but in the past maybe not three years but let's say five okay. or let's say to seven. Chair Councilman, yes. uh, that may be true okay. but I'm saying that we've increased our standards uh, that we now have uh, bi-weekly hiring meetings for all of public safety uh, that the mayor has tasked us with coming up with standards that uh, exceed the expectations that we've had in the past okay and we've implemented so those. chair to the chief are you saying that are you saying that officers or people that come from other places who have had disciplinary problems or have any type of issues, they wouldn't be able to trickle into the Cleveland Police Department. Through the Chair of the Councilman, what I'm saying is that we have a vetting process for everybody that comes to our academy. Uh, I'm a not going to say it's that- the recent vetting process. Over the last three and a half years, okay. I'm not going to say that an officer that has an issue with another department is never hired. It depends on what that issue is. 
uh, but we have standards, and if they meet those standards, then we hire that officer. If we think that officer is going to be a problem with us, then we don't hire him. Right. Um, Chair to the Chief, is it possible that, uh, let's say, for example, you have an officer that has had some grievances uh, against him or her um, that has been clearly biased? Um, what is the firing process of this officer? Do they, do you take them off? Do they get desk duty? And I don't know these, uh, I just watched some TV and I'm just talking about these different things. I don't know the exact lingo of it. But my question is, is it hard to fire, get rid of these officers that have shown that they haven't been good for our community? Chief. Uh, through the chair of the councilman, uh, I don't think it's hard to fire those officers. Um, the, the, the process starts with us and the hearing process with the officer because, you know, every person employed by the city has to um, has a right to be heard. Uh, whether they're accused of something or not, they have the right to be heard. So we have a hearing process that we go through. And then if we come to the conclusion that that person should be terminated, and that's done by the director of public safety, who's the appointing authority, then that person has the right to an appeal. Just like if a person is convicted of a crime, they have a right to appeal that and, and, that's and what have somebody happens. make that decision. And I respect you, Chief, uh, so I don't want to cut you off. But that's what usually happens is that you have a situation where officers, um, or officers get into some issues or whatever, and then the union stands up for them and then they end up remaining in their position. They end up staying there, whether they, you're taking them off the street and then they're put into a different position. So I guess my, the question that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm, and maybe you're answering it, um, but I'm, I'm just not getting it, is, is that when you have officers who have a history, let, let me be more direct. If you have officers that have had a history of discrimination against the very community in which they are there to serve, how do you deal with that? Well, if we're talking about hypotheticals, uh, if that officer... There's no hypothetical. History, this is not hypothetical. Well, again, yeah. Councilman, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 yeah. I, Councilman Jones, go through the chair, too. Uh, this is not a two-way okay, conversation. Okay, chair to the chief. It's not hypothetical. All right, so chief, please respond. Through the chair to the councilman, uh, if we have an officer that's accused of those things and charged with those things, and there's a recommendation for termination, I expect them to be fired. Uh, those things that you mentioned, uh, again, it's hard for me to answer because we're not talking specifics. Uh, but if you're painting a broad picture of somebody that's abused our community, I expect them to be fired, period. Okay. So, Chair to the Chief, if, they, if there are um, grievances, um, how would the residents make grievances against police officers? Through the Chair of the Councilman, the Office of Professional Standards accepts complaints against police officers by citizens. Chair to the Chief, are there grievances that have been, uh, haven't been, uh, no results have happened as of yet? Are there, my question is, are there grievances that just, that's been on a shelf that hasn't been handled yet, is my question. Uh, through the chair of the councilman, I, I think you're asking, are there complaints that have been filed against officers that haven't been adjudicated? That's a better way. Yes, sir. Yes, they are. And the judge talked about them earlier. And, and, a I backlog. Would, and Chief, if I could just yes. pause you here, just to my colleagues and those interested, two weeks from today, Councilman, we're going right. to have that. And we'll be able to get deeper onto your line of question. But please continue. Okay. Okay. And, and I, where, I'm, where I'm going is that we, we're all, more importantly, we are all here because we want the city of Cleveland to be safer. Yeah. So we're on the same team, even though I'm asking these questions, we're on the same team, we want the same things. Yeah. But the reality is, is that what I'm hoping, uh, Chair to the Judge White, um, and maybe this is happening and just my lack of knowledge about it, but we're hoping that, that there's an issue with the system. That's, that's what I'm thinking. There's an issue with the system. A young man came to me just the other day who's very interested in becoming a police officer, but he has some, he has a, a, a criminal background, a criminal background. Now, when I say that, of course, you, you can't help but to say, well, he was a, he's a criminal. But within America, uh, there's groups of people who can easily become criminals um, than other people. And what I mean by that is that um, they are more heavily policed than other groups of people. And as a result of it, it has an impact on their life. 
As I said earlier uh, in, city, in the city hall chambers on Monday night, I'm, I'm one bad stop away from, from being murdered. I'm one bad stop away from being arrested. And even myself, as a councilman, have a sense of trauma when the police drive past me. Even if they are the best police officers in the world, which most of them are, I still have this nervousness. So this young person, you have young people who are from the community who want to become officers, but feel as if that the system is, a, is against them. So I guess the point that I'm making is, I'm hoping that this consent decree, and even beside the consent decree, as some of my colleagues have said, that it becomes just a practice within the city of Cleveland, that it becomes open for all people. And maybe there's a way, and I don't know, Chair to the Chief, if this is possible, but let's say you have an individual who does have a criminal background. And when I say criminal background, you know, he has a ticket, or he didn't, he had a, whatever the situation, whatever is on his record. Is it possible that you look at these people case by case and say, this wasn't murder, or this wasn't rape, or this wasn't this situation, we can overlook that and you can be allowed into, uh, into the police academy? Or is it, do they have to have a clear, clean record, no issue, never even jaywalked? Um, you know, what, what, yeah. what can happen, Chief? Through, chair the, chair, Chief. through the chair of the councilman, uh, we don't have a, uh, a clean slate policy. Uh, there are people that have uh, misdemeanor convictions. There are people that have traffic violations and things like that that become police officers. Um, however, there is a, uh, a state law that prevents people from carrying a firearm with certain felony convictions, and we can't hire those people. Uh, we can't go back and erase something that happened in a person's life. Uh, all we can do is set the standards going forward, and if they meet those standards, we hire them. Uh, we're going to open up a, uh, a um, testing uh, application and testing process here next week. We have, over the last two and a half years, encouraged everybody that wants to be a police officer to apply, take the test, and go through the process. Everybody, regardless of whether they think they have a record that disqualifies them or not, because we'll take a look at that, and maybe it doesn't. Uh, I mean, you're giving me examples of parking tickets and maybe misdemeanor things that may not preclude them from becoming a police officer. But they don't, they have to apply. And we're encouraging everybody to apply. Uh, just want to, on that point, yeah. are you, you allow? Uh, yes, sir. Councilman Jones on this point, but sure, or Joe Jones. M Mr. Chairman, just on the point of, of, of hiring police officers, and my colleague down at the table could do me more justice and add into more detail. But there was a program that was in MLK to hire police officers uh, as well as firefighters. And it's my understanding for some reason it was terminated. Um, or that there's an issue there. And I don't know why that is because, you know, we should be working with our school systems as feeder systems uh, into our various different departments. There's no reason why we should be sitting here right now talking about um, we don't have enough African-American police officers, we don't have enough African-American firefighters, um, and we don't have the personnel. We should be drawing from our school system uh, young people who are interested in getting into the profession. So I just want to say, why is that closed down and what can we do to open it up? So I, I, I'll entertain a brief response to that question because it's not, it's somewhat tangential res related to the line of questionings. Um, we've yes. discussed it already when we had a hearing in April on the deployment plan, Commander Johnson talked about it. Actually, your cousin, uh, Councilman Bashir Jones, uh, that's something that he's passionate about too. Um, so brief response, and, and then I wanna come back to the consent decree. Uh, I'll have Commander Johnson uh, respond to that. <laughs> Go ahead, Commander Johnson. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. Chair to the Council. Uh, I believe you're referring to the, uh, this is your the public safety program at MLK. I can speak on the police perspective and say that it's not closed now. Uh, yesterday we actually gave them a tour of the Justice Center, and tomorrow we're giving them another tour. I cannot speak on the fire and EMS aspect of it because it's a separate component. I can only speak of the uh, police part, and we're definitely moving forward with it, it's especially with uh, Ms. Coates at MLK. She's doing a phenomenal job with it, and we support her. So, so have we received recruits from that program? Yes. You have we, I'm sorry. Have, have we hired anyone coming out of that program? Oh. Uh, and if so, how many? To the chair, to the councilman, yes, we have. I know of a couple. I don't know all the 
uh, exact numbers that we've hired uh, over the years. Uh, but I do know that there are a couple of officers that are still on the job now that went through that program, including uh, one of our deputy chiefs. Councilman Bashir Jones. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. And I, and I hope that we can uh, have another session yeah. where we discuss the fact that you, you had a, uh, a new fireman class that come in, came in, mm -hmm. and there were absolutely no minorities, no women, no African Americans, no Latinos. And, and this is a problem. But anyway, we'll get to that. And, and in regards to the MLK program, um, I just know of one person, Officer Bobby Sumlin, um, and I don't know of any other officers um, that has come through that, that program. But um, in saying that, Chair, just to make it clear, um, you know, Chief, Chief Williams has done a, a phenomenal job, man, and uh, we were the talk of the country during the Republican National Convention for the work that we did here. Um, but the, the issue, only the issue is, is that we still have some serious things going on in our city, and we're on the same team. We're on the same team, and we want to achieve the same goals. And uh, if, we, if we come back five years from now, um, uh, I mean, the chief, you'll still be here at, at, this, uh, at this position. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, you too. <laughs> but if we come back, let's just say next year, Councilman Plunt's going to be here. Oh, yeah, he'll be here another 100 years. <laughs> Whatever he's drinking, I want some of it. <laughs> I ain't sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if we come back next year and the numbers are still where it is, we, we, there's something going on. And to, when you look at the demographics of the police department, you know, uh, someone will, might say, well, maybe the people are just not um, African American, Latinos, women. Maybe they just don't have what it takes to be an officer. And that's just not the truth. There, there, there's something else going on that I'm hoping that we can collaborate, uh, collaborate and, and, and make sure that we come together and make it happen. So, Chair to Chief, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I, I'm going to temporarily excuse this esteemed panel to go there, and I want to ask, I'm, and, and I'm going to excuse this esteemed panel, and now I'm going to invite Dr. Yvonne Connors, along with Jason Goodrick uh, from the Community Police Commission. Dr. Connors in front of me. To those who are listening on TV and those who are in the room, um, as I said at the very onset of this meeting, some people were in this room, some weren't. We were going to have two special presentations. We heard the first part of that. Now we're going to um, have an opportunity to hear from uh, Reverend Dr. Yvonne Connor who's a co-chair of the Community Police Commission. Her colleague, Richard Noth, couldn't join us here for this afternoon, but we also have Jason Goodrick, who is the executive director. Uh, before you two individuals um, uh, go in, I believe you know Dr. Connor, all of our colleagues. Maybe if we could have them introduce themselves quickly. How are you, Councilman Bashir Jones, Ward 7? Blaine Griffin, Councilman for Ward 6. Uh, Councilman Joe Jones, uh, representing the Lee Harvard Ward 1 area, uh, the home of the Fighting Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Councilman Mike Plensick, who just stepped up briefly as the Vice Chair. Um, good morning, Dr. Connor. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you for uh, being here and joining us. So you saw the first presentation. So we'd like to hear from your perspective, um, work uh, that, uh, uh, how do you feel uh, work that uh, the City of Cleveland is doing towards coming into Compliancy with the consent decree, constitutional policing. What are you hearing out there in the community? And, and so the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Goodrip, for being here with me. Uh, I'd just like to um, first um, just remind everyone that the Cleveland um, Community Police Commission, and we refer to ourselves as CPC, was established under the Selman Agreement. And the position of the CPC is to really leverage our experience um, so that the members of the community um, will have their voices um, heard at the table. So the mandate of the CPC is uh, guided by a monitoring plan, um, which is produced annual, annually by the city of Cleveland on behalf of the stakeholders. Uh, the Cleveland Division of Police um, has worked closely with the monitoring team as well as with the CPC uh, since 2005. And uh, that relationship um, continues to grow. 
and uh, we worked on uh, the civilian um, review board uh, early on in the process. Uh, we worked on bias free, uh, many of the, pro uh, the policies that you have already discussed. So as, as we, uh, as a commission, uh, move forward, uh, there are five goals that we are shaping our work around because as we look at policy implementation, uh, as you've heard, a lot of the policies have been, um, I'm gonna say completed. I don't know that I would use the word implemented okay. because there's still a work in process. But uh, one of the goals is to really improve uh, the CPC's public meetings because we have a mandate to actually interact and be engaged with community in, uh, in an effective way. And so, uh, as many of you will know that on a monthly basis, we would have a public meeting. And uh, we started out with numbers, um, high numbers, and then we start to dwindle. Mm -hmm. And so, with the consultant that we hired, uh, we are looking at uh, quarterly meetings now with the public. Another um, goal for us is to increase community participation, mm -hmm. uh, a big thing uh, that uh, we heard from the city. And as we continue to really work um, with that, um, we strongly agree that the community and problem-oriented uh, policing policy is the vehicle to do that. And building relationships, and um, someone used um, uh, bridges uh, for the minority um, com uh, communities, uh, the marginalized voices, is, is one of the um, tools that we will use. And how do you do that? Building relationships take time. Uh, and and uh, what we are finding is that we need to work closer with the council, and I, I say that because in each of the different wards, as we learn from um, the consultant that we hired, is that we, as a commission, would serve the community better if we start um, partnering with existing organizations, mm -hmm. existing um, um, community members that have already penetrated certain areas of the community. Mm -hmm. Now, we can go and try to which we do, um, start uh, uh, ourselves, you know, in a way of engaging. So that's, that's one piece that we're looking at. And another strong piece is to in, educate the community. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about CPOP, we talk about the consent decree, but what we were hearing even from the other panel is that we, that's still a large uh, uh, um, block of activity that needs to happen. So this goal is the deliverables really span from the work of the search and seizure group, uh, work group which um, with you, t you heard about earlier, but they are looking at an education piece that says know your rights. So they are building that again, how do you build relationships? You have to get out where the people are yeah. and, and uh, not just be a talking head. And another piece uh, dealing with CPOP um, we had in November the Nicole um, uh, organization and uh, we introduced at the community-based oversight. How do you teach community members to be part of, of the solution and teach them skills around oversight? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't all come to the table with law degrees, and, but we love the community. So with that Nicole uh, relationship, we are looking at ways that we, we're talking about how do you teach community members to do problem solving? How do we teach them to really build those skills? So we're looking at a one and a half day uh, learning session um, that would help build on this goal. Another is working with groups who, as I said earlier, who've already cap have a captured audience. And uh, one thing that uh, our earlier panel um, didn't uh, touch very much was the district police committees. Um, these happen on, on a monthly basis uh, in the community. Um, uh, CDP, the city, has a plan for uh, really uh, helping these committees uh, broaden their reach. So we will um, be part of that. And um, another um, thing that the community members, uh, especially the ones that are gathered here supporting today, um, we're looking at Seattle because Seattle, as, as we've heard, 
uh, had a consent decree, um, they had a commission, but uh, as the consent decree um, came to closure, there was a way that they had legislation um, that really provided oversight. So that takes me back to the community learning to, to be part of that and be in a way where they can actually be heard. So that, that gives an overview um, of where, where we are and uh, CPC and how we see ourselves being part. Um, and to, to really answer the question about how is CDP doing, they, you've heard there have been great strides. Fabulous, um, and I use the word fabulous um, in a complimentary way here, uh, in terms of the success. Um, and, and as community members, um, we want to keep before us um, page two of the consent decree and uh, looking at um, part four, um, where there are nine items that are outlined uh, that um, that are being looked at by the city and in various um, various ways in terms of um, where are we uh, on a continuum. All of them are not in the same place in terms of um, the accountability systems, um, resource deployment, uh, community um, policing efforts, uh, policies around that, officer support, training, equipment, uh, and supervision. And then the Fourth Amendment, which uh, we've been working on with search and seizure. So that gives a long list that, we talk, that, that we've heard about today and the policies uh, in place. But then I, I would have to take you to um, paragraph uh, 401 of the consent decree um, because we would be at 100% when we reach that and this is termination of the agreement. So if this is 100%, and I, I would have to go through some, some measures, but to say that we are making strides. And as we heard that there are some things that are farther along than others, but um, I think we, we all come to the table um, feeling good about where we are and the relationship. Good. I just have a few questions and then I'm gonna ask Mr. Gilrick to make uh, some remarks and then we'll open up to questions. First of all, you know, you and your colleagues have put in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours uh, let me remind everybody uh, that this commission <laughs> is not compensated. Um, so uh, on behalf of the citizens of Cleveland, thank you. Uh, I know it's a tremendous um, commitment on your part. It not only infringes on your personal time and your family time, but I know you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't believe in this. So I wanted to just publicly thank you on behalf of my colleagues. Um, uh, your voice is important and, and so we thank you and, and your other colleagues for, for what you do. Um, in terms of uh, the makeup of your other commission members, are you at full complement of commission members now? Uh, yes, we are. Um, with the help of the city and um, the selection panel, um, we have two new members, so we are at 13, and right. three of those um, um, uh, law enforcement support. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what, what uh, Dr. Connor was referring to is, uh, the FOP, the CPPA, and the Black Shields all have a permanent seat on the commission. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you um, for, for what you do. I get you on the list. Um, Mr. Goodrick, anything else you want to add to um, the opening comments from Dr. Connor? Well, from a, a staff perspective, um, we have now a, um, we are only short one member. So to refresh council's memory, um, we are, um, building towards a staff of five for supporting uh, the okay. commission. Um, and we are four out of five complete. Um, with myself, the executive director, um, we have an assistant administrator who began this year. Um, a project coordinators, two positions for that, one doing community engagement, one doing marketing. The marketing is the current vacancy. We're doing interviews uh, at this time. And then one policy analyst to assist the CPC. Um, there's been a great cooperation between my office and the, uh, the city, I believe, and this office and our community partners as well. Um, the commissioners have, have put in a tremendous amount of time, especially those yeah. who are approaching the four years, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, we do have two uh, fresh faces on the commission, as uh, Dr. Connor mentioned as well, and our work groups uh, do the, the bread and butter of the work, and um, 
we've seen a lot more community interest this year than we have in the past year, I would say. So I've been since 2017. Mm -hmm. I have seen many members of the community now join the work groups. Mm -hmm. Many organizations come back to the table with the CPC. Um, and it's been a, a, a wonderful year of growth for them. And, and that was uh, partly um, through use, use of consultant and then their own searching for how do they want to finish this last four years out of the first four year term. And I think they've, they've made some excellent choices in the last year. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Connor, um, in, in your opening remarks, um, you have, uh, your, your testimony today was that you feel that there have been substantial progress, but there's still more work to be done. In, in your mind or in your colleagues, the commission members' mind, is there any particular area that needs more work uh, um, in terms of working towards compliancy than, than others? Um, as as I um, set you know, to represent our colleagues, I, there is one specific uh -huh. area that I that we can think of, because there, as I read through the front end of the consent decree, right. there were nine specific um, elements. I'm gonna, uh, elements that yeah. needed to be addressed. So those are being addressed. It's not as if any of them uh, are being overlooked, okay. but we are at various stages. Right. So until everyone's trained and, and um, then the clock starts ticking in a, you know, at a different level mm -hmm. in terms of how things are implemented. So I, I don't know that anything is, has fallen off the radar, okay. so to speak. No, that, and that's yeah. what we want to hear. I mean, yeah. um, you know, the natural fri friction of government, you know, we're the legislative mm. branch and mm -hmm. we work with the administration and, and sometimes we don't always agree with the administration and, mm. and we try to highlight or daylight issues that um, the council feels on behalf of our constituents needs um, uh, attention to. And, and it's been my um, understanding that the administration has always been open and receptive to the council's thoughts and concerns. So I wanted to give you that opportunity if there was a particular element, whether it was search and seizure, use of force, other elements on policy or procurement of other stuff you're hearing about, equipment and training. You know, I, I'd, I'd give you the floor and this is your opportunity to kind of state, state that for the, for the record. Yeah, uh, well, for the record, all I can, can um, refer to would be uh, two surveys that were commissioned by the monitoring team. Mm -hmm. And one dealt, and w you have to read those because we haven't really sat and talked through them as a commission. Mm -hmm. One um, was from the community members, a thousand plus community members were being asked how they felt about um, uh, CDP the perception and as 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 you heard from the other panel sure. and and even uh, from Archive. your colleagues right. uh, here chair that there's still work to be done yeah and that's what that survey says and then there's another um survey that was commissioned by um the monitoring the team let me finish this that statement. that um speaks to how officers feel. Mm -hmm. And so um, 75 officers were um, interviewed. And, and, and so there's some things there that, that we could unpack. But I, I uh, again, those were commissioned by the monitoring team. So if you take, you know, take a, a look at that. So that there's work still to right. be done in terms of how people feel that they are supported and uh, how the community feels. Yeah, we, you know, um, it, I'm going to come to you, Councilman. I know you want to make a comment on this point. Um, you know, as humans, change is uh, uncomfortable for people. It's uncomfortable because of the unknown. And, and sometimes as humans, we, we tend to be um, sometimes focused in on what we do over and over and again. And so when we're trying to make change or create new policies or do things differently than we've done it, not only is it difficult for those who are responsible for adapting and doing uh, things differently, but it's also, I think, challenging for the community to understand, like, how much substantial progress are we making towards that? And, and so this is going to take time. This is, we're in it for the long haul. And that's why I asked the question, and I'd be curious to hear your response. I asked uh, Judge White and Ch uh, Chief Williams, I mean, you know, accountability, you know, how are you going to embed, you know, assuming that at some point in the future, a lot of this training goes away, or I mean, the concentric here goes away. This training aspect of what we do just can't go away. So right. in your words, 
why don't you share with kind of the CPC's uh, expectation for um, making sure that a lot of the policies and programs and training carry on in perpetuity. Can you speak to that? Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I would, I would um, share from the perspective of, one, the community involvement and looking again at how we engage community because the community needs to speak to what it is they are willing to support. Mm -hmm. So when you look at longevity, and um, as a, again, that some of the community members want to take a look at what Seattle's done in terms of having a legislation that would be um, um, part of a referendum or uh, from the council that would support oversight for um, a long period of time. When uh, we have people that are trained and they get the support that it takes to change culture, well, that would be uh, long, um, long standing. But I would say we need the community to help support that. Mm -hmm. And um, again, this is something that um, there's an accountability um, workshop coming up next week mm -hmm. that the commission, um, one of the com um, commissioners is leading. So um, I don't know that there's one, one specific thing, mm -hmm. but I, I, I continue to say we need the community to be engaged, to keep their voice at the table. Mm -hmm. And as the CPC, we are committed to um, putting together education mm -hmm. so that community members can give oversight from their perspective, mm -hmm. teach the community member about uh, problem solving so when they interact with the officer in their, in their community, um, they would be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and things, and this sounds really simple, but um, we caught a, um, a film clip of officers that were helping out with filling Easter, Easter um, mm -hmm. candy bags. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are things, so some, some interaction with officers when you're not just coming for a call, and again, that's what we heard from um, the other team as well. So when those things um, can be in, in, in place and be implemented on a regular basis, um, you, we talked about the 20% uh, uh, for every uh, officer to be um, engaged in, um, in the community. Um, I, don't, I don't know, you know how to measure that. You know, Chief speaks to that um, better, but I, I think just when an officer can interact in a non-threatening way mm -hmm. uh, with a community member. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, as the commission, are hoping, um, and we will, we will accomplish. But we have to build the bridges. They, they, they are not there yet. Yeah. They're not there. Well, let's open up to questions from my colleagues. Um, I have Councilman Griffin and Councilman Joe Jones. Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask a question real quick on her presentation, just for um, information. Well, you, I have you second on the list of just a brief question and then a brief response, and then we'll go to Mr. Council. Chairman, can we get the, um, the uh, Dr. Connor talked about the surveys that were done in both the civilian as well as the police department. I'd like to have a copy of that. I'd like to go through those surveys. I would like to understand. So I will just say I know because Dr. Connor sent it to me and I had John James send it out to all the council members to fill it out. And, and so um, has that period closed where you were taking comments? Because I know you've done surveys on a lot of questions. Um, no, no, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Chair, request, this, these, the, these, oh, let, let, let him restate the question. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Council. Chairman, the, the survey was already completed by the civilians uh, that Dr. Connor um, testified, mm -hmm. and also police officers also uh, filled out their survey. So this was after results. So this is not a, a, a survey that we can fill out. This is the survey that's already been done, to my understanding. You want to see the like results? To request to see those results and see what those what that survey had to say in both the civilian side as well as the police officers. Dr. Connors, and then Councilman Griffin. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, those two surveys that I. Uh, mentioned are posted on the monitoring team's website. Okay. So those those have been completed. That that's um, a different um, questionnaire. So it's Can completed. It was completed actually the summer of uh, 2018. Can, can we have a copy of that, Mr. Chairman, um, to the doctor? Yes. Not, uh, we'll get that. Staff's taking down notes. We'll get that to you. I will remind all my colleagues and. We've, 
we, we all this data is is in the World Wide Web, and I mm -hmm. know you don't want to go searching for it. You want a physical piece of paper you Shouldn't can look be able at. to bring it here. We're putting and, a lot and of money so, into this. Councilman Griffin. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. First and foremost, I learned that you have to clean up what you mess up sometime, and I mispronounced Alicia Kirkman's name. It's Alicia Kirkman, <laughs> not Angela. So I apologize. I had a brain freeze for a moment, <laughs> uh, but I will say that. Um, Dr. Connor, first of all, I appreciate the time that you put into this. Um, as you started out with a lot of people, with a lot of energy, and um, a lot of those folks have left for several reasons. You've stood the course, mm -hmm. and I think that's to be commended because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always what people are doing, and that's why I acknowledge some of the, you know, community residents that are here today um, and mothers that um, have lost children to um, police-involved shootings is because it's not what people do when everybody has their eyes on it. It's what you continue to do when nobody's looking. That's right. And I think, you know, you and a lot of the folks need to be commended for that. So I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm also happy to hear that you are working with uh, NACO, National Association for Community Law Enforcement Oversight. I would caution, however, as you clarify about legislation that is needed, that this commission, even though it does give significant input, recognizes the community that is not necessarily, you know, have the same, it's not legislated as of this moment, if I'm not correct, to have the same authority like Seattle's commission for oversight. And if I'm hearing you correctly, that significant change and other things will have to be put in place in order for that to happen. Am I correct? Uh, Chair to the yes, um, that I, I guess I, I'm looking at two different uh, avenues when I talk about the legislation. Um, Seattle does have, and and I haven't uh, studied it deeply, but their commission moved to um, a phase where they are part of uh, maybe it's not the city charter, but there's legislation that supports their existence now that they have that they have met compliance and so they're no longer uh, under what um, what judge Oliver is doing for us they have another um, um, responsibility aligned lawfully legally um, for their position okay. and when I talked about Nicole um, this we're working on um, community members building their skills and building their network. For example, in, um, um, in November when some of the members from Nicole were here, we learned what's happening in other communities. Some of us will go and, and uh, gather this information, but it's good for a community member to have someone that they can look at and then be able. So I'm, they're, they're two different. And when I said partnering with Nicole, because on the community, um, uh, level basis, you can get some a certification um, to um, at least say that you've gone through the different curriculum because we we are about educating the community. So it's two different yes. two different uh, things and, that and I'm, I'm glad talking you, about. And I'm glad through the chair to Dr. Connor. I'm glad you made that clarification because one of the things that we really um, looked at closely with the consent decree is that we wanted to make sure that the chief stayed the chief that mm -hmm. we didn't put a body or an entity in place that would try to um, have oversight or try to make political decisions or decisions built on anything else but the chief being accountable and us holding the chief accountable. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure as we talk about civilian oversight and civilian engagement that you know there is some differences between us and other cities. So I want to make sure we clarify that. M Mr. Chairman, I want to I, I don't want the CPC to go away, but I do want to understand an exit strategy. Just like we want to embed use of force training, all the training that we're doing with the Cleveland Police Department. Um, I do want to make sure that we keep a, civ a civilian entity. However, I think just like the Community Relations Board and other folks that if we're really going to look at charter items, and I would ask Mr. Goodrich and others to look at how this might work, as we transition, even though I know independence is critical to this process, um, you know, I just think that it needs to be institutionalized somewhere within the city um, charter 
within an organization within the city to maybe expand the community relations board's role and oversight or whatever responsibility that they may have or wherever else we may be creative to try to find where this can happen because redundancy and marketing and community outreach and other things cost money in government and we are responsible stewards of the government budget so we have to look at those things and make some critical decisions so the work you're doing is important but it'd be very good to see how we can eventually embed it even when the consent decree goes away how we can embed it in a certain department i know this council has a range of thoughts on that and i, I look forward to that rigorous debate but i would like to see some options at some point in time because i do think that this is critical to have and I also believe that they should be compensated as board members. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see how that could actually look, how we can possibly maybe expand that role, but it may be some give and take that the commission may have to have as you know as well as um the city of cleveland so i hope that we can maybe make that part of the process as we move forward um because you know who knows what the next administration may not have this as a priority and if it's not legislated then um it could stand a chance of going away so i want you guys to really kind of put some thought into that so that we could uh make sure that we keep the integrity of it, but there is some tough decisions that the CPC is gonna probably have to make at some point in time to see how they transition to an existing organization within the city. Mm -hmm. May I respond? No. Um, yes, no. please. Yes. Um, I, I will say that the um, current CPC, uh, by a consent decree, um, will um, dissolve in September. But there is discussion uh, on the way now with the city um, about what, you know, another four years would look like for a different panel. So that discussion is happening um, with the city and it's also, we have a committee within the CPC. So we're looking at that uh, in, in terms, and, and I'll take your information back as part of the discussion as well. Thank because we're asking ourselves, because as we are here, um, we, we don't um, feel like in September the book closes. There's still too much work to be done. Does that make sense? Yes, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. No, Just it does. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Joe Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly have been very patient, and I really appreciate your leadership. Um, the question that I wanted to ask um, Dr. Yvonne Connor uh, in her presentation, she talked about a number of issues. Um, one was uh, improving public meetings. And I had an opportunity to go to uh, one of the last meetings. So it was the very first, well, the last one, about maybe what, a week or so ago. And my colleague, Mike Polensic, was speaking there. And we were the only two that were there from the council. Uh, and maybe there were some that were there earlier, but I got back on the late end of it. And um, when I looked around the room, Dr. Connor was right. It, I didn't see the kind of community participation that I thought I should see at that session. And um, the, the, the second thing of, of note is, is communications. If we want to improve the participation from the community, you have to um, make sure that you're publicizing it um, and that all the council members know about when those meetings are happening uh, via email to their executive assistants and to their emails when you're putting it out so that we'll know when there was, those meetings are and that we can encourage our citizens. Uh, we have ways and means of putting it in a newsletter so that um, you, you, we can get you know, participation that way from our citizens. Now, another thing too, some of the topic matter that you had, I think was talking about uh, many police stations in, in the community and, and the sort, well, the neighborhood, if you go to say for an example, our community will help sponsor you and our community to talk to our citizens about uh, the work that you do and the various different surveys and you can come out there and I guarantee you, you'll have 125 to 150 people in attendance easily. Uh, if you don't, we would probably have to get a secondary site. Um, so communications, Mr. Chairman, and I don't know if the doctor, so I'll ask this question, do you have a budget for that? Uh, we, we do and, and I'll ask our ED to speak to that in terms of the budget. 
Uh, yes, as, as council saw uh, and approved our most recent budget in the mayor's packet uh, about roughly a month, month ago I was here. Um, we do have a position for marketing and communications, as I mentioned, that's the last one um, that needs to be filled and that will help with that. Um, we do ask uh, when we distribute that council redistribute to their networks, that mm -hmm. would be extremely helpful. We have asked that uh, since I uh, took, took uh, my position and, and before. Um, one of the first objectives was to connect with council and make sure that um, they were passing along the message for our meeting and events and for each council person who has done that, uh, it is appreciated. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can remind your staffs to, to do that, that would be wonderful as well to help boost that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and Mr. Chairman, you know, you're doing all this work, people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. we're, so spending, we're doing all of this work and the people don't know about it. The people are ignorant of these meetings that, that Dr. Connor is putting on. Uh, they don't know what's happening with the consent, uh, uh, consent decree. And, um, and, and you guys have just done a horrible job in communications. And every time you come here to this table, whether it be the command staff or you guys, and I'm asking for if you're, if you're making a presentation, it would seem to me, Mr. Chairman, that the bright idea would turn on. Give the council members something to put in front of them. That this is what we've accomplished with all of these millions and millions of dollars that we're given to you every year in our budget. Where is the executive presentations? And then why would, you know, you just say, oh, it's on the web. No, bring the presentation and put it right in front of us. And this is not for you, Dr. Connor, this is for everybody listening. Um, give the presentations, give this, this body the respect it's due. Because this body approves that budget of, la of this year of $1.8 million, $1.8 billion, rather, dollars. And so we should have that information. And, and I shouldn't, Mr. Chairman, be using my time to ask for information that this body should all automatically get. Uh, if, if, the, if we're having a presentation talking about the consent decree, then we should have the, 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 the most powerful men and women who sit here at the table to make sure that we're safe. We should have that, that stat, those statistics and that information given to us. And so I would ask that if you would do that in the future, um, and all of those hearing, if you do it in the future, this council person here would be very appreciative of it. And, and, and if you give it ahead of time, as it used to be done at this table when I sat here, um, it should be done again. And, and if the information is given in an appropriate time manner, then I can access the information. They may not even have any questions at all because you may have it all in the report. And so, um, but moving to forward on the issue of communications, I would like to see your department, sir, step up to the plate and do the job that it was created to do. Communicate to the citizens because these men and women in the back row here working very hard. These people don't know about what's going on. They're not jumping on their internet and looking at these internet pages. If, so you have to make that information known, what they're accomplishing and, and how they're effective at what they're doing. Now, Mr. Chairman, um, you talked about the various different goals that you have. Um, and one of them is to build a bridge, <clears throat> to build a bridge with the community. And I would like to make a suggestion, <clears throat> and this is for everyone else listening, that if you're going to build that bridge, one of the ways to build the bridge to say I love you more than anything in terms of the police department and the community is not only doing the nice things that you're talking about doing, helping kids out and, 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 and participating in, in, in different activities and, and then going to various different uh, community functions, but one of the things say I love you the most is when there's an issue and someone makes a phone call because their house is being shot up, <clears throat> the police get out there right away. It's called customer service. Providing services, helping people resolve their issues, say more effectively than anything that we care about your issue because we're here on time. And, and I talked about it here at the table that Tried and true, when you call the fire department, they're there right away. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our police department responded just as quick as the fire department? When you have those kinds of services and you're providing that level of service, uh, it makes a profound impact. Barshir Jones brought up the issue about 
having minorities hired onto the police department. And the significance of doing that is to, to, to be able to have a department that looks like the citizens in which uh, they're being policed to have the same people look like them policing them in their communities. And the only issue why you have that, Mr. Chairman, is because he talked about cultural training. There is a huge gap in difference uh, in those police officers who come from a family environment, may not even live in the city of Cleveland, may live in Shaker Heights, and then they have to deal with, with um, the African-American culture and the conditions of our community and the situations and the issues. So they need to have training to understand the complexities of that. And I don't know if we have cultural training. I know it was discussed and I'm not sure if we do, but we need to have that. It needs to be a part of this package. That's part of the problem is, is how you approach a situation. And when that man and that woman gets out of that car, Mr. Chairman, if they have an understanding of the environment they're stepping in and knowing how to, to deal with the situation at hand, it says it speaks volumes. And coming out offering a service. And serve our community. So my suggestion would be cultural training do we have that, Mr. Chairman, to Dr. Connors? Yes. Uh, the, it would take um, the city to really speak to that, but I can tell you that that's part of, of the CPOP plan, is that officers would learn about the community that they are serving. Uh, and that's just a short, but I, I know that that's, that's part of the plan. I'm scheduled to actually uh, participate in one of the CPOP trainings on May 7th, but I can say a yes and that the city is still here if they want to say. And, and Mr. More. Chairman, to Dr. Connors, and I won't labor it, um, I'm gonna give you my card and it's gonna have my email account on there and my cell phone and my assistant is Erica Smith. Um, don't hesitate when you're putting on an event, let us know about it. Um, and then I would love to, to have you come out to our community so that you can speak on, we can, Whatever the topic matter is, we, we, we open that up to the public so that they can have an opportunity to participate as well as to, to be informed and educated on your progress and, and where you are and, 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 um, and how it's making a difference for them. I think that would be important, Mr. Chairman. And I have no more questions for the doctor. I really appreciate I I, I conclude by uh, agreeing with uh, my colleague. Um, uh, Mr. Blaine Griffin as relates to the hard work that you do and um, it is my hope that you get the funding necessary and that your program stays in existence uh, and you can come to my neighborhood at least two or three times out of a year we'd love to have you thank you Mr. Chairman thank you Councilman thank you um, Dr. Connors uh, any other final comments you want to make before we adjourn for the afternoon um, just in, in Maybe in closing, um, the commission did uh, issue uh, at our March meeting um, a letter to the community, uh, and we called it a unity um, letter, where the CPC um, united uh, its efforts in support of our staff, our newly sworn in commissioners, and then it uh, lays out um, the different um, projects that we're working on. And I'll just highlight those in terms of uh, we are all um, uh, supporting uh, the accountability project uh, and Commissioner Logan and uh, Sergeant Jackson are leading those. We have community engagement, um, Mr. Uh, Anthony Boddy, uh, recruitment and hiring, um, Commissioner Richard North, Bias Free Policing Work Group, um, Dean Lee Fisher, and uh, the CPOP and uh, DPCs. Uh, I'm leading those as well as the community engagement assessment and then search and seizure which uh, is being led by uh, Gordon Freeman and uh, the commission looking beyond 2019 Mario uh, Clapton uh, so those are things that we we're working on and um, we did issue this statement at um, our last full commission meeting. Well, it, it, it please extend to your colleagues our appreciation for all your hard work as I said 
hundreds and hundreds of hours of pro bono hours are going into it. And, uh, you know, I've said it here many times too, I believe that uh, the CPP, CPC should be compensated uh, as well for the work that you're doing. Um, but I thank you for that. To my colleagues, um, we, two weeks from today, um, and this might be of interest to you, Mr. Goodrick, uh, we are gonna have the Office of Professional Standards here, as well as the Civilian Police Review Board, um, uh, chair, chair and other members to speak about what work they're doing and progress that they're making. I wanna thank uh, the city administration um, uh, for joining us and giving us an update. I wanna thank the Community Police Commission as well. This committee meeting stands well, adjourned to May 8th at 10 a.m. No, this meeting stands adjourned until uh, May 8th at 10 a.m. Thank you all.